Greetings, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you for uh, tuning in to another broadcast, uh, The Cows, Gusty Renegade, and Justice, and to share constructive information uh, about what racism is and how it works. Uh, as I try to say as often as possible, I hope uh, this program is of constructive value. I hope uh, people that are listening in, I hope you're getting information that you can use um, that helps you get a better understanding of what racism is and how to work against it. Uh, if that is not happening, if you don't find the program to be constructive, please invest your time and energy in something else, uh, support someone else's efforts, or you know, begin your own project, because I do not want people wasting time if they uh, do not find that uh, this program is of value, so please. Um, also want to thank uh, folks tuning in. Uh, we have a lot of uh, new listeners uh, tuning in uh, in Texas. Uh, I saw the folks down in uh, Houston, uh, McAllen, a lot of new listeners uh, in the New Jersey area, uh, East Orange specifically, uh, a lot of new folks, North Carolina, Charlotte, uh, Charlotte Roanoke Rapids. Uh, thank you for supporting the broadcast, and uh, as I just said, I hope it's constructive. Uh, our guest for today's program, uh, he was uh, supposed to be with us before, um, had tech issues and things. Uh, we were able to reschedule. He was gracious enough to uh, reschedule and come back with us today. Um, <clears throat> I uh, learned about his efforts. I heard him on a different program, and uh, then I went and checked out. He has a documentary film, uh, Unrepentant. Uh, it's linked in the description for this program. Uh, I would recommend checking it out. Um, I said last week it's one of the uh, few times that I watched or researched for a program, and uh, the material really bothered me, uh, just seeing the incredible amount of abuse uh, that these non-white people suffered. Um, but our guest, he uh, is a, uh, was a pastor uh, at a church uh, in Canada and just uncovered a long legacy uh, of abuse, genocide, and germ warfare against non-white people. And uh, it is a pleasure uh, to have him on the program to share about his experience, what he's seen, and what he's doing to work against that. Uh, you can support his blog. Uh, it's linked in the description for this program, his website, excuse me, uh, the address hiddenfromhistory.org. One more time, hidden from history.org. Privileged to have him on the program, our guest, Mr. Uh, Kevin Annette. Uh, are you with us, sir? I am. Thanks for having me. Thank you, sir. Um, I guess for folks, if they have not seen the film, uh, Unrepentant, uh, or checked out your website, uh, could you give a little background information just about who you are and the work that you do? Well, it's really been happening for about 20 years now. Uh, ever since I, I was ordained in 1990 as a minister in the United Church, which is the largest Protestant church in Canada. It was actually set up by the government back in 1925, and it's had a long history of kind of working uh, closely with the government in a lot of its uh, work. I mean, for one thing, it, it, it has saw as one of its purposes to uh, assimilate, that's the word they use, um, any non-Canadian group, any non uh, Anglo-Saxon group, if you like, uh, into the mainstream. What that meant is that the United Church was, from the beginning, along with the Catholic Church, they were the, the, the two main churches involved in setting up these Indian residential schools, which, which I began to find out about when I came to Port Alberni in 1992. Just a few years after I was ordained, um, I went there with my young family. I was married at the time with two young children. And Port Alberni is right on the west coast of Canada. It's on Vancouver Island. And it's where a lot of the missionary activity was happening in the late 1800s. And from Port Alberni, a lot of the, the local Native people were, were conquered and brought onto the reservations and into the uh, residential schools. And what I began to find out from Native people I began to visit and bring into my church was that a lot of children died in these schools. Uh, there was uncontrolled diseases. As a matter of fact, uh, a doctor who worked for the Indian Affairs Department in, in uh, the federal government admitted uh, he did a study in 1907. He found that in most of the residential schools that he went to, uh, children who were healthy were being deliberately housed with children who were sick and dying of tuberculosis, and they never treated any of them. And that happened decade after decade. So it showed you that they're using these schools as a cover for really depopulation, um, you know, wiping out whole areas of the country of natives so that they could get their lands and resources and bring in a lot of white settlers. And that happened all over Canada, but especially here in the West. 
uh, for the last 100, 150 years. You know, I began to meet the survivors of these crimes. Uh, I used to let them speak from my pulpit in my church, and that went on for about two and a half years. And finally, I got fired because I found out that the church had been selling off the, this land they'd stolen from the natives to various logging companies, including Weyerhaeuser, which is the largest logging company in the world. is based in Seattle. And, um, you know, there were these secret back de- room deals going on with stolen native land. And, and I, I wrote a letter uh, objecting to that, to the church. And within four weeks, I was just fired without cause. Eventually thrown out of the church, um, uh, the only public defrocking of a minister in the church history. They even worked with my ex-wife, um, encouraged her to divorce me and gave her documents, you know, to help her with that. And I lost custody of my children. I mean, it was a very bad time for me. But out of all of that, I began to come closer to the survivors of these schools. And over the last number of years, we've produced books and documentary films about this. I, it really was the work of our coalition that forced an apology out of the Canadian government two years ago for the residential schools. And, um, you know, it, it's kind of led from one thing to another, but it really started when I began to encounter on the ground a lot of these people who had gone through these, these terrible things. Wow. Wow. Yeah. We, um, that's, listeners, that's why I wanted him on the program, and I want to get as much detail as uh, about his experience as possible because... Uh, in watching the film and visiting his website, so much of what he details uh, in terms of how these non-white people, uh, the so-called Native Americans in Canada, were mistreated, it's the exact same story that you'll see if you do research about what happened to non-white people in the United States, mm-hmm. South Africa, Australia. I mean, it's identical. It's identical. Um, Okie doke. So before we get started, you, you are a white man, is that correct? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, My family came from Ireland and Scotland originally. Okay. Okay. Um, this program, uh, the cows, uh, context of white supremacy. Uh, I have unfortunately concluded that we are in a global system of racism, white supremacy, and the definition that I use for both racism and white supremacy is as follows: uh, a global system of people who classify themselves as white and are dedicated to abusing and or subjugating everyone in the known universe whom they classify as not white. Um, Do you think such a system exists, and do you think that definition is accurate? Well, I think generally that's true. I mean, we live with a legacy of that. I mean, the reason this genocide happened in in North America is because of exactly that system you're describing. Um, I think it was also religiously based. It came out of a system of Christendom where they said that, you know, people who who are Christian don't have the right to live. They don't have the right to their own land. But that coincided with white supremacy in a lot of ways. Um, So, yeah, generally I'd agree with you. And, And I think I don't see that system as really altering that much, even though, I mean, you know, I can give an example. Here in Canada, they occasionally let some native politicians in, you know, to uh, and, and consult them for various token uh, laws that are being passed in that. But by and large, native people, as non-white people in Canada, are still barred from the seats of power and influence. And I don't think that changes much. Um, you know, I, I didn't really see that change much at all, even though they've been forced now to admit that half these children died in the residential schools. I mean, we're talking over 50,000 children. There isn't a stir of compassion. I mean, in the white communities, like we've been talking about this for years, and, you know, you tell people literally the children are being murdered, and they, you don't see any concern or compassion. They kind of are quite indifferent. And I see that among white people in Canada, regardless of their political inclination, you know, uh, they, there's still that deep, racist attitude towards any person who isn't, who isn't, you know, quote, white. So, you know, I, you know, I think it's, it's something that is definitely ongoing. Hmm. Wow. Um, I guess that was, that was something that stood out to me um, when I watched the documentary. Again, folks, the documentary, Unrepentant, Kevin, Annette, and Cannabis Genocide. Uh, it's linked right with this uh, description. You can, you can watch the whole thing online. Um, when I watched it, and you, you were uh, a pastor uh, while you were doing this work and uncovering all of this. Mm-hmm. Um, 
it really stuck out to me uh, the role that religion played in all this. In fact, I, I put the verse in the description for this program that you used in the documentary film, uh, Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 5 and 6. Uh, this is what you are able to do to them. Break down their altars, smash their sacred stones, cut down their Asherah poles, and burn their idols in the fire. For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord and your God has chosen you out of all peoples on the face of the earth to be his people, his treasured possession. How does that relate to what happened to these non-white people? Well, that passage was used continually by missionaries uh, all over the Western Hemisphere, well, all over Africa and Asia as well. Uh, whenever European white missionaries went into an area, they would say basically, we are the chosen people. Um, those who aren't Christian, um, you know, we have the right to conquer and do to them whatever we want. And they, you know, they cite that biblical passage. They also were uh, authorized to do that by the, by the Vatican. Uh, they passed num numbers of laws in the 14 and 1500s which said that any non-Christian people have lost the right to their own land because they're not Christian. And they encouraged, uh, you know, there's this papal law in, in called Romanus Pontifex in 1455, and the Pope said any Christian king is obligated to go in and enslave and destroy those people. Um, it's an act of faith, in other words. It, so it isn't just, you know, kind of fanaticism. It's right in the very mainstream of white European culture. Wow. Can, what is that act again uh, that the Pope issued? Well, there were two of them. In 1455, Pope Nicholas, he passed a, a law called uh, Romanus Pontifex, and it basically said, uh, it referred to all non-Christians as Saracens and Pagans, and it said that uh, you're obligated to go and enslave and destroy them uh, and take their land. And uh, then there was another one in 1493 called Intercatera, which basically divided the world between Spain and Portugal. You know, everybody in the, in the Western Hemisphere got handed over to Spain, and Portugal got the rest, you know, of Africa and Asia. And, uh, you know, it's just a big power grab, and it used religion to justify it. And that it was definitely, I mean, it was kind of the ultimate white supremacy because it said one man in Rome ruled everybody on earth and had the right to hand away their land and, and everything. And it's just absurd. But, you know, that power is still there. I mean, it, I'm reminded about that fact because the other day, um, Obama's government announced that they were going to support the Vatican in their, uh, you know, the, the, there have been attempts to sue the Vatican directly because of all the abuse that happened in these Catholic schools and orphanages around the world. And there's a group, so I'm actually working with a group in the States that are trying to sue the Vatican for what happened in the Indian boarding schools in America. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the government, U.S. government has said you can't sue the Vatican because they had nothing to do with it because they're a government and you can't touch them. I mean, that's basically helping to obstruct justice and saying it's all right for this, this institution to have done this for all these centuries. And I think that's criminal, you know, concealing that kind of, and, and helping the, the, the people who did these crimes get away with it like that. Wow. Wow. And this information, you all can check this out if you visit uh, his website, hiddenfromhistory.org. It's linked, uh, if you're listening at Blog Talk Radio, just click his name and it'll take you right to the website. Um, well, so I guess... Would it be correct to say it is it is impossible uh, to talk about um, how racism and white supremacy was carried out uh, really worldwide without addressing how Christianity has been a fundamental, really the foundation of how this has been carried out worldwide? I agree. Yeah, I think it's it's really tied together. And these institutions, you know, I often say to people up here that the trouble with trying to get this uh, action on all of these crimes is the people who did it, the institutions that did it, are still in power. You know, it's not like after World War II where the conquerors, you know, put the defeated on trial. And, and you know, that's easy to do when you win a war. But, but here it, it's never happened. Um, and so we, you know, like in Canada right now, the government set up a thing called the Truth and Reconciliation Commission mm. to look into the residential schools. But it has no power to subpoena or lay criminal charges. When you go before the, the, this TRC body, you can't name names. You can't talk about wrongdoing. Um, it's just set up to protect the, the, the institutions and to really muzzle the, the witnesses. And, you know, you've got to come to expect that and when, it, when the system is kind of investigating itself. And, uh, you know, there's just so much you can do within that system, I think. Mm. I hope uh, 
folks out there, uh, I hope that name rings a bell, Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Uh, they had something similar to that in a different area of the world, and I think it had fairly, I think it had very similar results uh, for the non-white people involved and, and how things turned out, but that's another story. Um, okay, so all this starts. You're, you're in Canada, Port uh, Albany, and mm -hmm. You are just doing your work, trying to go out and increase uh, the size of your congregation, bringing in white people, non-white people. What kind of stories did you begin to hear from the non-white people? Well, it actually happened the first week I was there. I, I um, opened a food bank because Port Alberni was a very poor town. It was traditionally a lumber area, and a lot of the mills were closing down. A lot of people had one of the highest unemployment rates in both the white and the native world um, in Canada. And so we opened a food bank, and a lot of the people coming were native, so I started inviting them up to church. That did, wasn't, didn't sit very well with some of the older white people. They didn't want Indians in the church at all. So that was kind of a struggle to get people in then in the first place. But then I opened the pulpit, and people could get up on Sunday after I preached and talk about their own stories or you know, comment on what I said or anything. And that's where we began to hear these stories of children getting killed. But um, the first native home I visited, and I described this in my film, uh, Unrepentant, I was sitting there with Danny Guess, who was a native fisherman, and his best friend had been killed in the Alberni Residential School, which was run by the United Church, the church I was working for. And I asked him why there were no native people coming to the church. And he said, well, it's because they killed my best friend, and they buried him in the hill behind the school there. And all the white people know about that. They don't want us to come to church. And I heard those kinds of stories literally every time I went into a native home. Those kinds of stories were told to me, as they still are. Oh. Did you have any reason to believe, you know, these people are exaggerating, I don't think that's true. Did you have any reason to think that this, you know, can be made up? Well, you know, I, I suffered from my own racism back then, and it's kind of it's so inbred in you as a, as a white person growing up here, and I kind of automatically thought, well, they're just kind of resentful that we took their land. They're, they've got a grudge against white people and they're kind of exaggerating that has to be the case because I couldn't believe that the church I was raised in would be responsible for those things right but what I did unlike a lot of the white people in my communities I continued to listen to those people I continued to st and I could see in their eyes that they had suffered that they weren't making it up um, I began to challenge my own church about that and I was told in no uncertain terms to back off and not look into that stuff you know a number of times church officials threatened me about that. But I felt I had to keep going and bringing that up because, I, you know, of all the terrible consequences I was seeing, they, I, I had to do a lot of funerals of young Native children um, and also teenagers who, who were killing themselves at a really alarming rate. That was a very common thing to happen, and I realized that was coming from somewhere, all of that pain in the community. So I was kind of looking for answers about that, and, and I kept facing brick walls all the time, especially in the white world. Wow. Wow. In, in your film, uh, in Unrepentant, um, you talk about how, I think the term you used was, it's still an apartheid community in terms of the white people being indifferent uh, or out and out telling you, uh, we're not interested in this, uh, stop asking these questions, uh, and having, I guess, no interest in having the native non-white population come to the church. Um, is, that, is that accurate? Oh, yeah, very much. Um, like a lot of, you know, kind of rural towns in Canada and, and in the U.S. too, um, there is this kind of unspoken apartheid where you just don't cross the line. Uh, there were no white, uh, no Native people working in any store in Port Alberni. You didn't see them teaching. You didn't see them in any higher kind of occupation, even though they were a third of the population. So I tried changing that. You know, I, I tried changing that in a big way, but it would have been kind of like going into Alabama in the 60s and integrating the churches there, you know. It was, it, it's just, um, you, you didn't do that kind of thing in part of Burning. So I was, you know, I, I immediately began to get repercussions for having done that. You know, I was getting death threats, um, all, all sorts of things. And, and, of course, they got worse after I was fired as I began to, you know, directly challenge the churches over what they did. Mm. Uh, I think that's been brought up before on this program that if, if you are a white person and you are not doing things that support the system of racism, white supremacy, you will get in trouble with other white people. <laughs> I think uh, uh, Reverend Annette, I'm sorry. 
Oh, I agree with you. <laughs> mm. I was going to say, I think uh, I would submit your experience as Exhibit A. Um, okay, so these, these residential schools, um, I guess I, I'm very ignorant, so this was all news to me. Can you kind of talk about what a residential school is, the history of these institutions in Canada? Well, they really started in the 1800s. They were like mission schools where the priests and others would go out and gather up all the Indian kids and basically uh, try to destroy the family system by taking them away from their parents. Uh, there was a law brought in um, in 1920 in Canada where every native child older than seven had to be in these schools or their parents would go to jail. And the, the schools carried on right till the 1990s. And, what? Uh, yeah, what? 1996. Well, 1996 was the last one that closed. And uh, you, you had to go to these schools. Uh, it was a law. Uh, in the schools, they weren't really schools because most of the kids never got an education. They were taught kind of the rudimentaries of reading and writing. And then they were used as cheap labor. Uh, they were hired out to farmers. They were, they, the young girls were used as domestics. Um, they were creating a slave population, really. And you see the effects of that all over the native world now. Uh, people still suffering in a big way from, from the effects of it and passing those effects on to their children and grandchildren. Um, and, and so, you know, the... Uh, I've had white people who taught in these schools describe to me that they were never allowed to show any uh, humanitarian feelings towards Indians or to be fired. Uh, they all had to carry straps. They beat the children mercilessly. They never fed them properly. Um, they, they had sterilization hospitals where children who were particularly smart had to report for sterilization. That's been documented um, really well. It's one of the reasons we say genocide happened because when you're trying to make a group infertile like that, it's a clear indication that you're trying to wipe them out. And that was happening all up and down the West Coast here um, in hospitals run by the United Church of Catholics. Um, you know, so these kinds of crimes against humanity were going on. It isn't just about, like when you, when you follow the Canadian, the, the very limited coverage this gets in the press up here, um, they always refer to it in terms of physical and sexual abuse, and that's it. But in fact, everything that, that is described as genocide in international human rights conventions. All of those were occurring in boarding schools in the U.S. and Canada, both. Um, you know, killing, uh, making people infertile, just you know, creating long-term conditions where they're going to die off, like taking them off their land and tr their traditional way of life, creating disease and spreading it. I mean, all of that was going on. Yet it's still not considered genocide. And uh, that's because, you know, I mean, like I said, these churches and governments still have a lot of power. Hmm. Um, again, context of white supremacy, I guess, uh, Reverend Kevin Annette. It is Reverend, correct? Oh, yeah. Well, I, I don't go by that a lot, but I mean, <laughs> I still have a community church in, in Vancouver, but uh, yeah. Okay. okay. I still have the title, even though they defrock me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, I guess two two things jumped out at me there. I guess number one, definition is very important. Um, I'm looking at the the definition for genocide right here: deliberate killing of a large group of people, especially those of a particular ethnic group or nation. By that definition, what they were doing with these residential schools, you think qualifies as genocide? Absolutely, it does. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. Well, uh -huh. just on that too, you know, the, the, the guy who invented the term uh, was a refugee from Europe in World War II. His name was Raphael Lemkin. And when he talked about genocide, he meant it in a very broad way. He said it wasn't just physical violence. It was anything you did against a group of people uh, to try to wipe them out over the long run. So if you take away their language, if you put them in schools where, you know, boys and girls can't mix and have normal relations and therefore they grow up and, you know, their family problems because of that, um, when you take them off their land, all of that is considered genocide. But in the West, uh, that could have indicted the U.S. and Canadian governments for, and the churches for, for you know, what they were doing in the Indian boarding schools. So the U.S. and Canada helped change the legislation at the U.N. so that it wouldn't apply to them. And they did that by emphasizing the physical extermination rather than the cultural end of things. You know, it's all, it's all genocide, but we've kind of been brainwashed to think, no, it's only genocide when you're shooting people, you know, and that's not true. Hmm. Wow. Wow. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. I tried to uh, make sure we, we get evidence for things. You said specifically that if there were young, native, non-white students in these residential schools and they 
looked like they were intelligent, uh, were some of the smarter ones, that they were targeted to be sterilized. Is there, you said, and this is documented, can you, can you point us yeah. to some of the documentation for this? Well, the documentation is in my book, Hidden from History, the Canadian Holocaust. A lot of the testimonies and also uh, the laws that existed in British Columbia and Alberta, which were passed in the 1930s and allowed sterilization of, of any Native person. Mm-hmm. Um, there's also a good book uh, you know, published in the States called War Against the Weak, uh, America's Plan to Create a Master Race. And it talks about how basically white doctors in the 1880s developed these laws which allowed any group to be sterilized. And um, it was aimed very much at blacks, at Indians, uh, uh, you know, people who were considered mentally inferior or whatever. Um, and it's, uh, something like 33 states in America passed these eugenics laws. And they were very racially targeted. Like in, uh, in Canada, about a third of people sterilized were Aboriginal, even though they're only 2% of the population. This was happening in uh, you know, hospitals here in Nanaimo. Uh, Bella Bella, British Columbia. I've got it all documented, and people can um, see some of these documents if you go to um, you know that hiddenfromhistory.org website or contact me, and it's in in my book. A lot of these things. Wow. Wow. Okay. Um, and again, hiddenfromhistory.org is linked in the description for this program. Just click uh, Reverend Annette's name, and it'll take you right to the website. Um, the book he just mentioned, uh, War Against the Weak, that is by Edwin Black. Okay. Edwin Black, War Against the Weak, Eugenics and America's Campaign to Create a Master Race. Sounds like an excellent read. Um, okay. Um, the information I got watching your film and, and uh, going to your website, you detailed uh, very specific things that were taking place in these residential schools, uh, pedophilia, uh, germ warfare, uh, smallpox, and tuberculosis, uh, 50% mortality rate. Uh, I wanted to kind of give some details about each of these. Can we, can we start with the pedophilia? Well, definitely. That's something that's ongoing, actually. One of the groups I work with in Vancouver, we've been documenting child trafficking on the West Coast, and this kind of thing never stops. I mean, for a long time, it was based on the Indian residential schools because it was so easy to get children. Um, and these networks are still active. But um, within the, the Indian school system, you see, under, under the Indian Act, when we're talking about apartheid systems, in Canada, there's still an Indian Act, which says... Um, you know, there's no Irish Act or Italian Act. It's only an Indian Act, and it says if you living on, uh, if you live on reservation and you get government money, you're a legal ward of the state. You're not a citizen. You don't have the right to open a bank account, go to court. You know, you're like a child or a mentally incompetent person. The government manages your life for you, and that's the condition of Native people on reservation. Because of that, they're not in a position where they can refuse any order by the government. So they can come onto a reservation, take their children away at any time. They can't do anything about it legally. Um, they can't even refuse vaccines or hospital treatment or medical treatment um, under the Indian Act. So it's set up, you know, it's kind of like a ready-made system to, to uh, if you want to, to obtain children easily. That's what the residential schools were doing in a big way. A lot of children disappear. We have a lot of testimonies of people seeing, you know, children being lined up like at a slave auction and, and chosen by these white guys who flew in on a seaplane and then took the kids away and you never saw them again. That kind of thing is documented a lot. Um, and so, it, you know, it, there's a big, um, uh, one of the elite establishments in Vancouver is called the Vancouver Club. And we have eyewitnesses who regularly see Native children being taken in there all the time. And people who work there describe that, yeah, there's child you know, rape and trafficking that goes on right out of that establishment. And, um, you know, that involves fairly senior judges, politicians. You know, it, it's it's fairly well known, but, again, these people have the power, so how do you take them on? Hmm. You said this is, uh, this practice is, is ongoing uh, in terms of easy access to uh, non-white Native uh, children. Yeah. Uh, hmm. Wow. Wow. Well, you know, it happens. Like for another example I can give you, like this last month I was working in this community center in Vancouver, uh, and a Native woman came in, and she said that the social services people came in and took all four of her children because somebody had given an anonymous complaint that she wasn't dressing her children properly. 
So without even doing an investigation, they come in, the police come in and with the social workers, sees all four children, one of whom was still breastfeeding. She hasn't, hadn't seen her kids in three months. And that would never happen to a white woman. It's just that Native people are targeted that way because it's an ongoing campaign just to break up and destroy their, their culture and their families. And so, you know, this, uh, these are the kind of cases I work with all the time, and yet you never see it reported in the press at all. Uh, it's just like a hidden reality up here. Mm. Wow. Wow. And I just I want folks, because I know... Uh, particularly with the Catholic Church, there's been a lot of publicity over the last 10 years about the uh, pedophilia and things and, and child molestation. And uh, I've seen a lot of, of outrage about this when the victim is a white person. I just want people to think about that, the contrast when the victim happens to be a non-white person. Do you see the same sort of clamor and people, you know, getting really riled up about this and saying that this needs to stop? Um, Wow. Okay. Well, no, you don't. You don't see it at all. I mean, like I've been working on this for 15 years, and uh, I've yet to see really any outrage at all in the white world about what's happened. Um, you know, to native kids and and others. Hmm. Mm. <sighs> wow. Okay. Uh, next, germ warfare. Uh, you said that this this did take place in the residential schools. Yeah, that's right. As a matter of fact, one of their own doctors, uh, his name is Dr. Peter Bryce, and he was hired by Indian Affairs to go study the, you know, the Indian residential schools. He wrote a report that got him fired. Uh, again, this is in our film. And uh, in 1909, he found that um, half the children were dying every year in the schools. And he said it was because they were being deliberately exposed to TB and then never helped or treated. They were being deliberately starved and starved and uh, brutalized and, and exposed to diseases and then, you know, not helped in any way. So that was reported in Canadian newspapers in 19, the same year, and um, nothing was ever done about it. He was simply forced out of the government. Um, over the years, there was a continual report of the 50% death rate because of d diseases. As recently as the 1960s, uh, government officials were saying that uh, huge numbers of children were dying because of uncontrolled disease. And again, these were being deliberately spread. Uh, and the proof of that was the fact that in the white world, uh, the rate, the tuberculosis rate was continually falling because before penicillin, you know, they'd isolate people in sanitariums. And then when penicillin came along, it was easily treatable. Yet all throughout the 20th century, the TB rate continued to climb constantly in the Aboriginal world because, you know, the government was deliberately not doing anything to stop it. So all of that shows intent. It wasn't just kind of accidental you know, this disease sadly kind of spread uh, like it was an act of God or something. No, it was, it was deliberately introduced and then they stood back and let it have its, you know, impact and, and that still goes on, you know. Uh, I just, to, to point this out for folks, um, saying this is deliberate since it's not, you don't actually have white people coming in injecting folks, to my knowledge. Um, but Well, actually they did. Um, <laughs> There was uh, a smallpox campaign. I I've, I've found this stuff recently. It's going to go in the next edition of my book. There were Anglican missionaries in the, uh, in the year 1864, which is when a lot of the white settlements started on the west coast of Canada. Um, and there were Anglican missionaries who, uh, the newspapers in the uh, central part of British Columbia were reporting this. They were going out among the interior native tribes and injecting them of uh, these smallpox inoculations. You then had about an 80 to 90 percent die-off rate. So most of these communities wiped out by smallpox. And then the land was bought up very quickly by the Anglican Church and sold off to Hudson's Bay Company and others. So the, the church was making a lot of money by, by deliberately spreading the disease. Um, on the East Coast, there was a British general, Jeffrey Amherst, who kept journals about how they spread smallpox by taking blankets out of the hospitals and handing it out among the Mi'kmaq Indian tribes in Nova Scotia. That's been published now, the, the Amherst Journals. You can look that up uh, on the Internet. Um, and, you know, this Gener General Amherst had colleges and cities named after him. But, I mean, you know, he was pra practicing germ warfare, and he said in the journal that we have to do this to wipe out this race of people. I mean, he was saying that in black and white. So definitely it was being done deliberately, you yeah. know. Hmm. <sighs> um... Even for acts that are, are not as deliberate uh, as that, 
Mm -hmm. uh, even things that might look like, well, you know, just having the kids together, maybe that was an accident, maybe they didn't know. Uh, you're saying that uh, comparing this to what the white population was doing at that time, it was standard procedure to quarantine. If an individual had uh, yep. tuberculosis, they would not be around other individuals who were not contaminated. That just would not be done if it was a white person. That's right. And, uh, you know, my mother, who she grew up in, in the 1930s in, in Winnipeg, in the central part of Canada, she said she remembered when a young boy in her class got tuberculosis the very same day he was out of there. Wow. And he, he was in a sanatorium, and they didn't see him for six months. We have pictures of Native kids with open tubercular sores sitting alongside healthy children in a classroom in Alberta. We have eyewitnesses who describe, and again, they're on our film, Unrepentant. They describe how nuns forced them to play and sleep with children who were, who were coughing away with tuberculosis and never separating them. So it was a really common practice. And, uh, you know, I mean, it's like you can look the other way then and say, well, oh, it's unfortunate they're all dying off. But it was definitely because of that practice, which was didn't just happen once or twice. It happened over 50 years. All through the early half of the 20th century, this was a regular practice. So the question is, if it wasn't intentional, why didn't they stop it after the first year? Why didn't they then start doing healthy practices? But they didn't for decades, and that definitely shows that they intended to keep it going. Hmm. For, I guess, okay, people who would say, well, the problem is we just, we just didn't know about this. We didn't have any idea that these atrocities were happening at that time, uh, or even right now. People say, you know, hey, I, I had no idea. I wasn't alive back mm -hmm. then. I had no idea any of these things were, were happening. What would your response be? Well, first of all, uh, under the law, uh, they say ignorance of a crime is no defense. You can say, I didn't know that, uh, you know, that was going on. But if you're paying the taxes, if you're uh, supporting a system, then you're under the law. You're a, you're a complicit actor, whether or not you're aware or not. Uh, so that's the first point. Next is, uh, it's not true that people didn't know. Because don't forget, the, in 1907, when Dr. Bryce first found out about this, the two largest newspapers in Canada were reporting uh, the Ottawa uh, Citizen reported uh, on November 15, 1907, they had a front page article, and it described the mortality rate in these schools. In one school, 69% of the children had died off. So this is published in the main newspapers in Canada, so people at that point don't have the defense of ignorance. I mean, they knew what was going on, and they chose to silence Dr. Bryce, ignore the whole thing. As a matter of fact, within a few years of those articles coming out, the churches the Catholic Church and the Protestant churches got the government to abolish all medical inspection in these residential schools. So if you want to improve a situation, why do you abolish medical inspection? I mean, all of these are deliberate acts designed to kill off Indians, and frankly, everybody in Canada who, who was in the know knew about it. Um, and so they can't really claim that, that they've been ignorant. I mean, I think, you know, Joe Blow in the street may not be taught these things in school, but all you have to do is sit down and talk to the native person for half an hour and you learn these things. The thing is, white people don't want to hear it. They don't want to learn in a lot of cases. Mm. Again, privilege uh, to have him on the program, our guest, uh, Reverend Kevin Annette, and the website, again, hiddenfromhistory.org. Uh, you can get uh, books, read the blog, uh, and I hope people will watch the film because it's, it's excellent, Unrepentant, Kevin Annette, and Canada's Genocide. Um, you already mentioned the Indian Act, and I just want to be clear. Is that, that is still in effect? That's still on the books? Yep, it's still there, and it, the wording has changed very little since 1874 when it was first brought in. Okay. The, the other one, the, is it the Gradual Civilization Act? Yep. Okay. What, that, what is that? That was the early version. That was in the 1850s, and, and that was kind of the first one that came in. And what it did was it said that if you were an Indian and you wanted any kind of recognition in society, you had to enfranchise, which is you give up your land, you give up your identity as native, and then uh, basically we won't kill you. You, you know, you, you, you don't have the right to be a citizen or vote or any of that. But if you don't enfranchise, then you're outside the law, and it was basically it's open season on those people. So it was kind of a, a form of blackmail to get native people to, to surrender their land. And... Uh, you know, it, it, it was uh, that idea of um, Native people who 
didn't assimilate, didn't have status in society. That's still the case now. I mean, if you're if you're not under the Indian Act, the, the, a lot of the native people living in cities, they don't have any government funding. Um, massive police brutality. You, native people are killed every week by police in Canada, and the police are never reprimanded. I mean, they're shot to death, they're tasered to death, uh, beaten. I mean, a, a good friend of ours in December was beaten to death by three police in an alley in Vancouver. Uh, Johnny Dawson, and he was very uh, vocal. Uh, he spoke out a lot about the residential school crimes, and they targeted him. There's never been an inquiry. There's no autopsy being released. I mean, and this kind of thing happens so often about Native people because they're they're in a different category. I mean, they're they're outside the law, really. Hmm. Again, I hope people listening in. Uh, one of the reasons I was, you know, very appreciative of being able to do this program. Um, this should sound very familiar for anyone. If you have ever studied racism, you know anything about what they call uh, racial profiling in this area of the world, this should all sound very familiar um, in terms of, of just outright abuse and slaughter of non-white people. Um, <clears throat> Okay, so you, you get this information. You're going out, you're talking to non-white people while you're still uh, the pastor of the church in, in Port uh, Albany. Um, and you already talked about it, the death threats. Uh, you said your white colleagues, they were telling you, you know, leave this stuff alone, stop doing this. Uh, they defrocked you ultimately. What other things did, did white people do to you and I guess are probably continuing to do to you to try to stop you from doing this work? Well, attempted lawsuits. Um they, you know, they often use the threat of a lawsuit. They don't follow through because I knew if we ever went to court, I could really open up this stuff, you know, demand all sorts of documents from them. So they don't actually ever want to get to the point of going to court over this, but they do threaten. Uh, there have been physical assaults, um, threats against friends and family, um, you know, attempts to bankrupt me, preventing my education. I tried to retrain and get a doctorate degree, and that was stopped um, by intervention from the church with the university administration. Uh, the University of British Columbia. Um, I mean, it's an, a real ongoing attack that doesn't really seem to stop, especially um, in recent, in the last year or two, as we've begun to um, do a lot more work into the child trafficking and how these crimes are continuing today. That's when you find, you know, a lot of more threats come in. And, I, you know, it's because the police themselves are involved in these things, um, politicians and other people with power. Hmm. Wow. Uh, and I, I thought that was important because you touched on that in the film um, to deliberately uh, break up your family and, and aid uh, your wife in, in divorcing you and, and saying all these nasty things about you. I, I thought that was also really uh, just these are the type of folks that you're up against, uh, ladies and gentlemen, in battling racism, white supremacy. Um, well, okay, so the, uh, the, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, you touched on it before. Um, I would think a lot of people would, would hear this and say, hey, they're trying to do the right thing. They're trying to, to make amends and be honest uh, about what happened uh, against the non-white people in this area of the world. Um, is that happening in your view? Not at all. In fact, the opposite is happening. You know, Canadians are very good at, at creating an appearance about something. You know, like when I was in Europe last April, or just last month, um, a lot of Europeans said, you know, we're amazed to hear that Canada had done these crimes. We knew America had, but I mean, Canada, you know, it's such a liberal humanitarian place. And, you know, the government is very good at creating these impressions, but the reality is all you have to do is go on the Google, do a Google search, look, and when you read the mandate in Section 2, of their, their statement, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. It says things like, we're not an investigative body. We don't have the power to subpoena. We can't uh, hold a formal hearing. We, we uh, cannot lay criminal charges. When people come and give evidence, they can't name, na name names. They can't talk about wrongdoing uh, that occurred in these schools unless it's been before a court of law, which very few of these crimes ever have. Um, and there's no immunity granted people. So it's very different than, you know, they keep citing the South African Truth and Reconciliation Commission. There's no immunity granted to anyone giving testimony. So a Native person coming in and talking can be sued for what they say, and they're not offered any protection. So when you look at that, that's not a genuine inquiry. It's, it's protect, it's, and the proof of that is the, the three commissioners who worked on this Truth and Reconciliation Commission, they were nominated by the very churches being investigated, if you can believe this. Hmm. <laughs> It, it's like it's like you know a serial killer getting to nominate the members of the jury. 
it's uh, it's ridiculous, and yet the media is portraying it like this is a um, you know an attempt to finally get at the heart of it. I mean, no, it, it's it's a, it, it's it will set up a a whitewash report, and and I mean, what kind of report can it be except a whitewash when you're not allowed to name names or talk about wrongdoing that occurred in the schools? I mean, it's going to be very slandered, and it's it's um, we've been encouraging people to stay away from it. We've been trying to hold a counter hearing in these communities where people can come and tell the full story. And eventually we want to hold, uh, issue a counter report so people can hear the, uh, and read the full truth of what happened in an uncensored forum. So, uh, you know, that's what we're trying to do now. Wow. wow. What, I guess to your knowledge, what has the response been from the Native people? Uh, how, how are the non-white folks there feeling about the, uh, the TRC commission? There's a lot of cynicism about it. it, it uh, the, you tend to get native support for it from within the chief and council system. These are government-funded native bodies that have pretty much been told that if they want to keep getting the money, they've got to support this government-run process. And you know, so you see a split in the native world, like like you would in in, in other communities, some against, some in favor. Just like when they started handing out money, you see, um, in, in the states, people get millions of dollars when they're raped by priests. In Canada, the most a native person could get is ten thousand dollars. They put a ceiling on it. You can't get any more than ten thousand, and then you have to uh, agree to a gag order where you can't talk about what happened to you, and you have to exonerate the churches. You have to sign an indemnity, which releases the churches from any legal liability. So, it, in effect, by getting this blood money, this ten thousand dollars, you, you're saying, okay, we'll never sue the church. They weren't guilty of anything. And that's really what it was all about. Uh, it's to it's to protect these churches, and I mean it's it's outrageous. But people take the money because they're so poor. Uh, that's all they're being offered, and it's like these TRC forms. It's all they're being offered, so they think they have to go along with it. But you know, these are um, the way, whole way this is going about is it actually in violation of, of international human rights conventions. It says, you know, the the parties to a crime can't set up an investigation offer compensation without, you know, having an, another, a third party come in and then monitoring that. I mean, you know, it, it, it would be, it, you know, it's ridiculous even the whole concept of what they're doing, but they're getting away with it because a lot of people around the world look at the surface of, uh, and say, well, it, it seems to be an, an attempt to, to inquire into these things, but it actually isn't. Mm. Wow. I, I know in addition... Uh, to doing work to enlighten people about um, how the TRC is just a refined form of racism, white supremacy, and is not uh, established to create justice for these people who've been abused. Uh, you've been working to show how the Vatican, they are complicit in what happened in this area of the world. Can you talk about that? Because I know you've made some trips. Uh, you've made some trips there as well. Is that correct? Yeah, I was in Rome twice in the last uh, six months. Uh, we, we were holding rallies outside uh, the Vatican in memory of the children who died, uh, calling for sanctions against the Catholic Church. Um, first of all, for people who don't know, the, the Pope now, uh, Joseph Ratzinger, actually signed letters to American bishops and others around the world ordering them uh, to conceal evidence of crimes against children, you know, the rape and the violation. Mm -hmm or face excommunication if they didn't. So the Pope is personally implicated in covering up these crimes. And as part of that, um, you see, the, 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 the Catholic Church actually set up these residential schools back in the 1800s. It was a, a model set up by the Jesuits uh, of how you go into a native community, you basically get rid of the traditional chiefs, and you bring in the Catholic Indian chiefs. They set up the, the, the villages you know, to, so that they're all loyal church members. And they, they modeled the schools on that system. And so um, the Catholic Church is really one of the main actors in this whole crime. Um, I'm working now with a, a native lawyer in America uh, who is uh, Ken Bearchief, his name is. He's suing the, the Jesuits and the Vatican uh, for a lot of these crimes. He's working, for example, in South Dakota with uh, children who suffered, or people, adults now, who as children suffered in these, these schools. He's, you know, one of the women who came with me to Rome, uh, Clarita Vargas, when she was a young girl in the 1970s, she saw a priest bury this little baby alive under the, the floorboards of the church because the baby had, was the offspring of a priest who had raped a young native girl. So they got, you know, they, they murdered the baby that way. And she was a witness to that. The, the local police won't even investigate. They won't even go to the church, 
to the church to look for the remains of that baby because, you know, they're protecting the church. And the South Dakota government, uh, just this last month, passed a law preventing the church from being sued. You can only go after individual priests. You don't, can't go after the, the church as a whole. The same kind of thing the Obama administration just did when they backed the Vatican's claim that, you know, they're not connected to this somehow. Um, it, you know, it's the same old story of the government colluding with the church and, but again, like you, the big actor in this is is the Roman Catholic Church. Hmm. I'm just think, I'm uh, a victim of racism, white supremacy, so my my thinking is a little different uh, as a black mm-hmm. person. But mm-hmm. I'm just curious for regular white person, conditioned, I would think, conditioned, trained to participate and believe in racism, white supremacy. How do they respond to hearing this about? The Roman Catholic Church, I mean, this, I would think, would have to, uh, either you'd have to dismiss it outright, it would give you some real, I would think, trauma around your connection to religion and your faith. Well, you'd think so. I mean, it's, it's amazing the power of denial. You know, uh, I, a woman came up to me once when we were holding a protest outside one of the Catholic churches, and she said, the Pope couldn't have done that. He's incapable of, of sin. And I said, pardon me? <laughs> you know, but no, they really believe that. A lot of a lot of people believe that, and they believe the same thing about their culture. I mean, you know, as white people, we came here to try to do the right thing, and to and you really get that attitude among Canadians that, you know, kind of the, the British Empire attitude of we we're out there to civilize the world and improve everybody, and it was for their own good that we enslaved them, kind of attitude, right? So uh, that's really hard to break through and change. And and uh, you know, in young among younger people, you find different attitudes. You know, a lot of people are more willing to believe these things. But uh, generally, you know, it's a real hard thing to break through. Hmm. As I'm sure you know. For sure. For even, yeah. even for a lot of non-white people. Um, I know uh, in doing this work, I know a lot of black people um, just have a real tough time believing that these sort of things uh, have happened, are continuing to happen. Do you see that amongst uh, the Native population in Canada? Where yeah. They really... Well, a lot of fear. You know, it's fear-based. It's not like it's not fear-based among whites, mm. it, but 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 definitely among natives. It's, it's a, a lot of most of them go around in a state of a fear, as you would. You know, I try to tell whites it isn't like like often people say. Well, I was beaten in school too, and it and you know, how are they any different? You know, it's like they don't understand that as a group, as a culture, you know, as a as a nation, they were targeted and still are. And in that way, you know that the system doesn't work for you, you know. I mean, like, one one guy told me about how the dentist used to work on his teeth without painkiller and in the residential school, and this is a common practice. So naturally, he's not going to go to a doctor when he's older. I mean, he doesn't trust anybody in the system, nor should he, right? So, um, yet that's something that's hard to communicate about how much the fear still has hold of Native people. They'll line up and, and go to these hearings when they know it's being run by the very churches and government that did these crimes, and it's a big whitewash, but it's conditioned obedience, and it's a really hard thing to break through. And I think, um, you know, you need an equivalent of, I guess, maybe what black consciousness was in South Africa, uh, where people have to take pride in themselves and take back their power that had been brutalized out of them over generations. And, I, you know, I, I, so there hasn't, I mean, that's only beginning in the native world up here. Hmm. Are you, because I'm, again, I'm, I'm a black person. I'm actually in uh, Seattle. I'm probably pretty close to the uh, oh, yeah. Weyerhaeuser uh, Logging oh, really? Corporation. Yeah. Um, yeah. There are, the, the, the missionaries uh, were very effective, and a lot of black people, they have very strong connections uh, to Christianity and, and religion, and that in some ways can impair their ability to to be honest with themselves about things that have happened and are happening uh, because of racism, white supremacy. Do you see that with the natives as well in terms of their uh, commitment and connection to Christianity or or the United Church? Oh, a lot, yeah. Uh, There's a lot of unfortunate divisions on reservations along religious lines. Hmm. Um, You have traditionalists who 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 never became Christian, and they're a very small minority. Um, You have a lot of, like, Native Pentecostal Church is really big um, in, um, on, on reservations, um, you know, and people are pitted against one another with these, by these religions, and so, yeah, that's definitely a, a problem, and it's kind of finding a common ground people share, you know, regardless of religion or whatever, 
they have an identity that look you're targeted by genocide and and that should provide a a, a basis for you to rally around because I mean it's it doesn't really matter what you profess as a native person um, you're still the target you're still likely like a, as a black person you you're walking down the street and it's not the same when you're white, of course, and you see a cop going by. I mean, it's it's uh, it's a totally different game. And Native people are, are still hiding in a lot of ways. They don't want to face that fact, um, partly because they're only about 2% of the population here. They don't have a lot of political and economic power, and um, they're forced to kind of accept what they're given. So that creates a real problem, too, just in terms of perpetuating that uh, kind of slave mentality. <laughs> Um, I want to have some more questions about exactly, you know, work that you're doing now and, and what you think should happen to try to compensate. But uh, folks did call in, so I want to double check the uh, the phone line. Uh, and if you would like to to call in to uh, ask Reverend Annette if you have questions, uh, call in number is three four seven. Uh, oh, I lost the number three four seven. Two one five six zero seven one again three four seven two one five six zero seven one. First person, uh, someone called in. Uh, Thanks to block number. If you have a question for Reverend Annette, uh, you're on. Uh, person called in with a block number. If you uh, have a question, your mic is open. Okay. Assuming they're just listening. If you uh, have a question at one point, you can press one, and I'll see your hand, and I can get you on to get your question. Um, other person uh, called in. Uh, last two digits nine two. Other person, if you have uh, questions, please go right ahead. Okay, I guess they're listening too. No problem. <laughs> Same thing for you. Press one if you have uh, have some questions. Okay, I know you talked about in the uh, in the documentary film, um, logging companies benefited a lot from this land theft and and mm -hmm. uh, that are still in business now. I didn't even know about the uh, Weyerhaeuser uh, Corporation. Oh, now see they. Uh, let me finish my question. I'll get you. They got a hand up now. Uh, okay. So the uh, the Weyerhaeuser Corporation. I didn't even know about that uh, right here in Seattle. Um, can you kind of talk about how that land, uh, it was stolen from the native population, how it got transferred to these logging corporations that are still in business now? Okay, well, just in a nutshell, um, the government, the Crown of England, claimed that it owned all the land in, in Canada, and it, it handed out to the churches what they call clergy reserves, so hundreds of acres of free land on native land for their use of their churches and residential schools. The churches would then flip that land to different logging companies for big, kickbacks to church officers. And I found out there, there was a deal like that happened on the west coast of Vancouver Island. In 1994, just before I got fired, I found out that uh, Macmillan Blodell, it used to be the largest logging company in British Columbia, it was being bought up by Weyerhaeuser in Seattle. It was the biggest corporate takeover in British Columbia history. It was about a $2.5 billion takeover, and it was facilitated by the government of British Columbia, by the United Church, which owned the land, and uh, by Native chiefs who were profiting off the deal as well. And basically, Weyerhaeuser went in and bought up all of the uh, the old growth trees that was on traditional housed native territory, and uh, they paid off the church and everything. And they they're now you know the, one of the biggest operators in the area. Um, so I mean you know it, it it it's that kind of thing happened all over Canada, and it shows that it's it's not just about you know the, these schools were about getting lucrative resources. It was about getting the land as well, and that's still happening. Mm. Um, okay, okay. Uh, last two digits, nine two. Uh, got you. You got a hand up. Your your line is open. Hello, can I be heard? Loud and clear, Hello. sir. Okay, thank you. Um, I missed uh, most of the program, but I, I did hear you speak about a uh, conditioned obedience, uh, Mr. Net. Is there um, what can you talk about? I guess in regards to uh, combating. Um, that conditioned obedience uh, that, that you've come across? Well, I think a lot of it's fear-based, and one of the ways, just from my experience, what we do is uh, I work in a, a poor part of Vancouver and with a lot of Native people, and what we often do is we'll do a protest or a vigil outside a church where a lot of these 
you know, the church is responsible for these crimes in residential schools. And what it is, what it does for people is that it helps them face their fear in a group. It shows them that when non-native people are willing to stand with them, they can confront the non-native society, like the white, the dominant society. And they're able to do that because they have allies. And so kind of doing something together like that, it gets people out of their sense of disempowerment and suffering. Um, and I've actually seen cases of, of Native men who I've known were very bad drug addicts actually come to terms with some of that because they felt empowered that, you know, one of them said, at least I'm doing something now. I can name my abuser. And once you can start naming the names and saying, this is what happened to me, then that's taking back some of your power. So I think it's something people have to do together, like collectively, and they got to do it vocally and publicly because um, you can just go so far in therapy and in a healing circle talking about it. At, at some point, people have to start doing something, and I think that's one of the clues about how we do it. Thank you. Thank you for uh, calling in. Um, okay, so I guess what would you like to see happen, the, the correct thing to do in terms of compensation to the non-white people for all this? Uh, and let's, I guess let's start with uh, the Vatican, United Church. Yeah. Uh, what would be the correct thing to do? Well, first of all, you've got to, you know, under international human rights conventions, the first thing they, they say about when there have been these crimes against humanity and genocide, the first thing you've got to do is consult the survivors. You've got to ask them, first of all, what is it that they consider right and just? And that's never happened in Canada. You've had governments on the native chiefs, chiefs saying, well, this is what we want, this is what we'll settle for, but there's never been consensus or a vote even taken among just native people across the country about what they, they want. So that's the first thing that's missing. There's no consultation. Second thing is, um, these are crimes against humanity, so a little pat on the back, an apology, and a bit of money isn't what's required. Under international law, there have to be uh, tribunals, there have got to be prison terms, there have got to be major reparations. And that means, for example, returning land stolen from people. It means recovering and reestablishing what the genocide took away, reestablishing language and land and traditions. And none of that is happening either. Uh, everything comes down to a, bit, a little bit of money. And then an exoneration of the parties involved. Thirdly, you need... Um, the society put on trial, basically. I mean, culture, this culture as a whole, my culture, committed this crime, and so we have to take, be held accountable for it. Um, so kind of on all of those levels, none of that is going on, and so um, that's why we say we have to start from, from the ground up again and do a genuine inquiry and have international bodies come in that have the power to uh, lay criminal charges. That's already happened in places like Kosovo, in Darfur, and places like that, and I think it should happen in North America, too. Hmm. Okay. Um, that, I'm assuming, that you talked about uh, reparations, I'm assuming some land would have to be uh, transferred back as well. Well, definitely. I mean, uh, the land base now among Native people is less than half of 1% of what it was before conquest. And, uh, you know, so in the whole areas of the country, they've got a, this land and resources have to be turned back. What you have happening now is when treaters are signed, uh, the land is not taken back. It's just uh, compensated for, in their mind, uh, in the mind of the government. They give you know a few million dollars, and that's supposed to make up for, for centuries of, of destruction. So, um, yeah, land reclamation is, is part of what real healing would look like you know, around the, the, this. But also it means you know, being able to tell the full story, uh, opening up all the, the archives. One of the things we've been uh, pushing for for a long time is the return of the remains of the children who died in these schools for a proper burial. There's mass graves right across the country. We've counted 28 of them already, uh, where thousands of these children are buried. The first thing they should be doing is returning those children for a proper burial uh, with memorial sites, you know, uh, museums, we're counting the real history, all of that. The, this real history needs to go into the, the, the high school textbooks. You know, the, the, the true history has to be taught, and none of that's going on either. So all of that's necessary, I think, in order for, for real change to happen. People are opposed to uh, these mass graves. People, is, there, is there opposition from white people to doing the correct thing, taking these mass graves and allowing for a proper respectful burial? Oh, totally. I mean, the, the media won't report on it. Uh, we go to the Royal Canadian Mount of Police, 
who were the they, they were the the policemen responsible for grabbing the children in the villages and and, and hunting them down when they ran away. Mm-hmm. Yet they're the national police force in Canada, and they're they have told me outright they're not going to investigate these graves. I mean, just outright they don't give a reason. But I mean, again, that's that's obstruction of justice. It's they know there's bodies there, but they won't investigate. Um, so we need a, another party coming in from the outside, you know, um, to, to to do that kind of investigation. Hmm. Wow. With, I guess, okay, so the pushback I'm sure would be, uh, you, you're talking about jail time. You said these are serious crimes against humanity and people should be, there should be jail sentences. Uh, you can't put anybody in jail for things that were done 100 years ago, 50 years ago. Uh, that's, that's just absurd. You can't go snatching up you know, somebody uh, right now in 2010 and saying you're going to go to jail for crimes that were committed in 1950. What would your response be? Well, you can, of course. Um, th- there is no statute of limitation on murder. And when there, in a lot of cases when these murders happened, um, yes, of course. I mean, they, they've done it with Nazi war criminals uh, and others around the world who committed crimes. It's not so much when it happened as the fact that these crimes are also ongoing. Um, you know, when, when the institutions are preventing real reparation and recovery, uh, when the assault on Native people is just as bad as it ever was, the death rate in the Native community is high as it ever was, you know, 50, 100 years ago, then obviously these things are ongoing. So um, people can be charged for those things, yeah. Hmm. Hmm. Do, you think a, do you think a Native person could do the work that you've done? Well, they wouldn't last long to be honest. I mean, and, and I know that from a fact. I mean, in the last six months, there's five members, Aboriginal members of our network who've died. Uh, one of them was a friend of mine, a chief in Winnipeg. Uh, he was about to lead a protest at these TRC gatherings in Winnipeg on June 15th, and he died in hospital. Uh, our friends, we've had numerous friends killed by the police. I, I don't think I would have, I mean, my white skin to some degree has protected me and allowed the story to come out. Um, but, you know, no, the short answer is I don't think they would have lasted long enough to be able to do this work. There have nevertheless been Native people who come forward all the time very bravely because they know what they have to lose uh, and, and try to do this stuff. And often they're scared off or silenced. But there's still a few of them who are, who are there working, working on this stuff. Hmm. Do you think uh, the Native people that you have worked with and organized with, do you think that they... Do you think there would be a difference in response if you were also a Native person? Do you think they would respond to you uh, differently, or would there be no change at all? I'd be ignored. I mean, white society here doesn't listen. They don't care when it happens to a Native person. I've had proof of that all the time. We've continually had, you know, I had a classic example of this. We were, we were at a rally some years ago, probably eight or nine years ago now, and at the rally uh, there was a, a Native woman, Harriet Mahani, who's dead now, but she was an eyewitness to a killing of a little girl. She saw and this is in the film, Harriet is talking, she saw the principal kick a little girl to her death down a flight of stairs, and she was under the stairs, she saw it. Uh, the media were at this rally, and, I, and, and this one white woman, who she was a, a, a television anchor person, she said to me in front of the TV camera, she said, well, you don't have any actual proof, do you? And I pointed to Harriet, and I said, she's an eyewitness, why don't you just go talk to her? The white woman looked at her, turned around, and walked in the other direction. And, I mean, that's the kind of response you get. You will not get many people, by and large, listen to at all about this stuff. Unfortunately, it's, it's the way racism works. They'll only listen to a white person, but then they don't even listen very long because the way they treat a, a white person who talks about this is they try to discredit them and marginalize them, which is pretty much what they've, they've done with me. Um, and, you know, if they killed me, I'd, I'd, it would be more noticeable than when they kill an Indian. So they have to treat me in a different way. But, I mean, it, it, it's the same kind of ignoring that goes on. Do you think non-white people would also um, not respond to you uh, quite as well if you were a non-white person, if you were a Native? Well, that's an interesting question because, I mean, often um, there's a lot of self-abuse that goes on in the Native world um, and a lot of infighting, tremendous amount of infighting. I mean, it's one of the legacies of this genocide. But... Um, um, actually, as a white person, I'm listened to more by natives than if I was a native person, and that's unfortunate. I mean, I often find that in healing circles that when I speak, native people listen, whereas when they then talk about it and they and they don't. 
how they find reasons not to listen to one another. So that's part of this legacy, I think. But you know, and they've got to struggle in their own way to overcome that. I mean, I can't do that for them, but I often get you know I have questions about how far I should push this as a, as a white person because um, it's eventually got to come from them, you know. And yet they are so isolated in the tech that it's very difficult. Hmm. Wow. Um. I think that's very important. That's that's a point I try to push as often as possible. Um, I, I think that is accurate. I think that's one of the uh, really devastating illustrations of just how effective the system of racism, white supremacy has been that both white people and non-white people would much rather listen to a white person talk about the damages of racism. I mean, that. Uh, I mean, <laughs> in my view, that's almost showing this system has almost been perfected um, if, it, if it's gotten uh, that efficient. I um, wanted to, to double check with uh, folks that called in. The folks that called in, uh, your line's open. Did you have any questions uh, for uh, Reverend Annette, folks that called in? Just listening right now. Oh, okay, no problem. Thank you. Thank you all for uh, calling and listening. Appreciate the support. Um, I guess i give out the website again, hiddenfromhistory.org. Hiddenfromhistory.org. As I said, the documentary is fantastic. Uh, Unrepentant, Kevin, Annette, and Canada's Genocide. Um, I guess before we get ready to close things out, um, can you kind of tell folks again some of the current work that you're doing. I know you, you uh, have this updated on your website. If you go check his blog, you can see his reports that he did while he was uh, at the Vatican and doing work there. Can you kind of just give us, you know, the current right to the minute what you're doing? Yeah, well, um, besides the work I'm doing in Canada, we're, uh, I'm taking a delegation back to Europe in September and October. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're, ho we're hoping to get uh, political support in the European Parliament for an investigation into genocide in North America. And we're, we're broadening this to include the United States now because for the first time in the last year or two, there have been lawsuits mounted in the U.S., uh, especially by this Ken Bear chief who lives in Yakima uh, and does a lot of great work with survivors there. And we're hoping to uh, get a, a motion in the European Parliament to get that international investigation started. So we're quite hopeful. I'm going to be spending more time actually down in the States. And uh, I'm, I was going to say to people in Seattle in that area, um, I'm going to be coming down and working with Ken. So it would be possible to organize some screenings of our film or, or something in the Seattle area if people want to work on that. Uh, that uh, I'll throw that idea out for you. <laughs> I would I would be interested in that. I think yeah. that uh, I think that would be construct. And you is is uh, Ken Verchief? Is he in this area? Yes. No. He his office is in Yakima, Washington. Okay. And um, and. Yeah, well, we can talk about that off on, offline if you like. Uh, yeah, yeah, I will. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would <laughs> love to get him. He sounds like someone I should have on the program. That, uh, yeah. Well, you should. You should uh, actually. You can contact him at uh, his email is kbearchief at msn dot com. Okay, k k bearchief, and he's uh, msn dot com. Um, and my email is hidden from history at yahoo dot ca. If anyone wants to write to me. Kbearchief at msn.com. Outstanding. Um, contact them. Oh, we, I think we got another uh, caller uh, question here. Let me make sure I get them. Uh, last last two digits, uh, 9 2. Did you have uh, another question or questions? Uh, yes, sir. I, I, want, I wanted to make sure I heard uh, Mr. Annette correctly. Did you say that um, the, I guess, Canadian police and enforcement officials that they have. Um, killed some of the non-white native uh, folks that um, that work with you? Yes. Yeah, um, Johnny Dawson, in, in December, he was one of our activists. He was beaten to death by three Vancouver police. Um, that's a regular occurrence. Vancouver police have killed a lot of native uh, in the downtown east side where I work. And there have been other very suspect uh, deaths that have occurred after people have spoken out about what happened to them in the residential schools. Uh, how many how many uh, white people work with with you on this um, you know, on your goal? Well, it 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 kind of uh, the white people who work with me don't tend to stay at this very long. Um, I've got a network across the country of of people who like do things like invite me onto campuses, uh, help hold vigils in that outside churches. Um, it's hard to estimate. I mean, it would probably be in the hundreds. 
if you did an actual count. But unfortunately, people in the white world are scared out very easily by this stuff. And a lot of pressure, pressure is being brought to bear on university teachers and, and you know, others who uh, showed an initial interest and then were threatened and kind of backed off. So it really fluctuates. And uh, the, the kind of consistent support I get is in the native world among, um, you know, just ordinary natives who are kind of living in the cities and that. And they know what's at stake. And so they, they really believe in, in getting the story out. And so you, you said the non-white person name, the activist who was killed, you said his name was Johnny, is that correct? Johnny Dawson. And uh, Johnny there's Dawson. stuff about that on our website. Yeah. Um, We're still trying to get a coroner's report, and he, they won't issue one. So. OK. What, what, uh, has there been any other response by particularly the white people that you work with in regards to uh, Johnny's murder? Well, no. I mean, I have a radio program. I should mention that um, on Mondays at one o'clock uh, on 102.7 FM. You can find that on the internet, uh, cooperadio.org. Uh, you can listen to uh, my radio program. It's called Hidden from History, and we often get on that radio program, uh, you know, people calling in and, and we talk about the, the murder of Johnny and, and other people. But uh, we've documented this again on our website. You can read some of that. But uh, it's it's like an ongoing thing. Okay, that's all I have. Thank you. Can we get that radio uh, address again, please? Um, co op, so C O O P, co op radio dot org is where, how you find it on the um, um, on the website. And um, once you go there, you can listen online. It's every Monday at 1 p.m. Pacific time. It's called Hidden from History. It's archived on my my, my website as well. Okay, coop dot org. Coop. Coop radio. So coop radio dot org. Okay, got it. And uh, Mondays one to two p.m. I do a program hidden from history. I've done that for almost ten years. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Coop radio. C o o p radio dot org. Got it. And yeah. it's, you said it's Mondays at one p.m. Pacific time. So I guess that would be four p.m. Eastern. Four p.m. Eastern. One p.m. Pacific That's right. time. Yep. Okay. Outstanding. Check that out, listeners. I'll be listening. I'm going to tune in tomorrow. Um, some other folks uh, called in, so I want to make sure. Uh, somebody called in. I got last uh, four digits, uh, 7908, 7908. Uh, do you have a question? Uh, just, just, Seven. Listening, just listening, Gus. Oh. oh, okay. Thank you for, for calling in, sir. Um, Last four digits nine nine zero. Oh, oh, that's Mr. Nero. Sorry, <laughs> Mr. Uh, Mr. Nero. If you have uh, questions, uh, you're on. Uh, not a, no, sir. I don't have any questions. Uh, oh, okay. Just totally thank, you. thank you guys for uh, listening. Appreciate the uh, appreciate the support. Um, all right, so we've got the radio, the blog again, hidden from history dot org, uh, the documentary film Unrepentant, Kevin Annette and Canada's Genocide. Again, I highly encourage folks, check that out. Um, I have to say, this uh, we've talked to a lot of white people. This has probably been one of the most informative uh, discussions that I've had with a white person and just being honest about racism, white supremacy. Um, Wow, I'm, I'm, I'm really stunned with the information and the honesty, uh, Reverend Annette. Um, I did, one thing I did want to share, words are very important. Um, use the term aboriginal uh, on your website. Um, I would request indigenous. Um, yes. Aboriginal, is, it's got that A-D on it. And, and for folks who are listening in, ab as a prefix, if it's ab or a, that means not. Uh, if you think about the terms like abnormal, amoral, asymmetrical. So if it's aboriginal, it almost sounds like we're saying these people are not the original when they most certainly are. Um, that, I mean, that's really the only thing I can say. I prefer indigenous over aboriginal. Well, you're right. That, that's a very good point. You know, it, it's easy, to, again, it's part of the way you're growing up. Uh, you, you hit with these terms at a young age in the word world, and you don't even know, know their meaning. But it, it's right, it does mean that if you look it up in the dictionary, not of the original group. And unfortunately, that does apply. I mean, a number of Native people in Canada have been so conditioned that they don't identify anymore with their own people. Uh, and you know, but that, but again, generally, it's true. It's it's a term like you shouldn't use the word Eskimo, uh, or well, even Cheyenne or any of those other terms. They're, they're from white people originally, and they don't they don't really mean what they're 
they're derogatory. So yeah, thank you for mentioning that. I didn't even know that about Eskimo. Why? That's uh, why. Well, Eskimo means uh, it, it's a derogatory term meaning uh, somebody who eats raw flesh. Um, Cheyenne Sioux. When you look at the original meaning, these were given by white settlers. Um, Sioux means a uh, strange person. I think in a neighboring uh, native dialect. Cheyenne, they think, came from the French chien, uh, dog eater. Um, yeah, yeah. Whoa. Whoa. Okay. Yeah, it's interesting looking in the origin of words. You're right. You're right. Wow. <laughs> That's what I said. I got Reverend Kevin in that A plus, A plus, <laughs> outstanding information. Um, yeah. yeah, I got to – I will chat uh, when the program is done and everything. Yeah. I will chat yeah, about the uh, Seattle screening because th this documentary is fantastic. I would highly, folks, if you're listening, it's linked. It's online. Check out the documentary. Chock full of information. And, yeah, and uh, Kevin Bearchief. Uh, am I getting the name correctly? Ken, 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 Ken Bearchief. Ken Bearchief. Ken Bearchief. Yes, I would, I would definitely love to have him on the program. And if you all are going to be in this area to uh, do a screening or, or do any work, I definitely would like to check it out. Um, yeah, we'll we'll chat. We'll chat. <laughs> the program is done. Um, thank you so much for sharing some of your Sunday you. uh, afternoon. We had to work oh, for hard me. and reschedule to make it happen, but I am glad we yeah. stuck to it. Um, I'll give you the last word. Anything you want to share or anything you'd like to promote uh, before we wrap up? Well, I, you know, I think knowledge is power, and once people are given this knowledge, we have a responsibility to share it. So just encourage people to watch the film through our, our website, hiddenfromhistory.org. And uh, also to try to arrange more events. I mean, I'll be spending a lot of time in the States now working with Ken and others to try to share the knowledge we've gathered to help the Native uh, people in the States in their own lawsuits. So um, just help us carry this on. Man, outstanding, outstanding. Um, I, I wish you, uh, I hope you are extremely successful in the work that you do and uh, get as much help and resources uh, for the uh, indigenous folks uh, in Canada as and here in, in the States if you're coming mm -hmm. down uh, to this area as well. Uh, we will definitely be in touch. And, uh, yeah, I, I, man, thank you so much for sharing okay. some of your Sunday afternoon okay. with us. Thanks, brother. It's thank you, sir. You. All right. Okay. Bye for now. Yes, sir. Uh, <laughs> Context of white supremacy, um, man, <laughs> he was uh, he was solid. I don't know if the people that that called in and they got to hear the earlier portion of the uh, program, but uh, man, very solid, very solid. Uh, I'm gonna take a quick commercial break. I'll go to the uh, the line so people can can share their views or what have you. Uh, if you called in, um, yeah, quick commercial. We'll be right back. Context of white supremacy. Is racism hurting you? On issues of race, are you unable to speak, think, and act with clarity and confidence? Are you tired of laughing when nothing is funny, smiling when you are not happy, agreeing when you really disagree? CounterRacism.com, you can learn specific strategies and techniques to counter the behaviors of the people who practice racism in all areas of activity. Using words correctly, following counter-racist logic, even counter-racist science projects designed to reveal what racism is, how it works, and how to counter it. The open source code writing format allows you to pick and choose from a variety of counter-racist suggestions so you can produce the code that works for you. Stop by counterracism.com today and help replace racism with justice. That's counter-racism.com. Context of white supremacy. Gus T. Renegade uh, in to uh, share constructive information. Um, yeah, it's a rare that I, I mean, this, I don't even know. This is, we've done a lot of programs at this point. I don't know. I think this, this could be 150. I don't know. We're, we're well over 140 at this point. Uh, it is rare that I have a discussion with a white person where I leave and, and thinking, wow, uh, this white person had a lot of honest and helpful information. Wow. Um, oof, 
yeah, I'm going to talk to Matt for sure. If he comes down to this area, I definitely will uh, see if I can do anything to help or get more people to attend if they're going to do a screening uh, in Seattle um, for his uh, his documentary film, Unrepentant. Um, wow, very informative. And one of the key lines that he shared on that broadcast, uh, the infighting amongst non-white people, that is one of the main byproducts from the genocide of racism, white supremacy. I thought that was key because you see the exact same thing with non-white people worldwide, us brawling with each other, one of the main symptoms of racism, white supremacy. Um, going to the uh, phone lines for folks, if you if you called in or Skyped or whatever, about to open the phone line up, but I did want to uh, share um, two things really quickly. I guess, well, number one, we'll be back tomorrow. Um, the cows is streaking right now. This is five consecutive days we've been broadcasting, and we sh- are scheduled to be back tomorrow. Uh, the irritated genie, uh, he will be back. Um, he was here April 1, and I think he had constructive information. Um, we'll be talking about feminism, uh, sexual intercourse with white people. Uh, should be very constructive. Uh, I'm glad to have him back on the broadcast uh, for a second time. So that'll be tomorrow at uh, 8 p.m. Eastern, 7 p.m. Central, 5 p.m. Pacific, The Irritated Genie and his website, War on the Horizon. It's linked on the show page. Um, check out their work. Um, fantastic, fantastic. I'm, I'm, I'm really looking forward to that. Um, also wanted to share uh, Raphael Sheck. I don't know if people got to check out that broadcast. I know some people did not think it was constructive uh, because the white person was not questioned aggressively. Um, I felt that was uh, pretty constructive, a very informed white person um, who had uh, just a ton of information about racism and white supremacy uh, in World War II against uh, black people from the area of the world known as Senegal. Um, when uh, the broadcast ended, uh, he sent me an email about those medals. If you if you look at the front page for the show and you see those medals, uh, one of them uh, has a, a large penis, all of that uh, wonderful propaganda and imagery of racism, white supremacy from World War II. Uh, he emailed me and he said that, uh, I'm, I'm just reading it, he said, uh, I just wanted to point out that those medals on your website depicted are in the French and the German editions of my book. I knew them before the English version came out, but the copyright for them would have been too expensive for my, for my purse. I had to pay for all pictures and reproduction rights myself. The French and German publisher decided to run the risk and publish them without following the rules, arguing that the pictures belong to the public domain. Uh, he did. He did <laughs> add that in that he was informed. I didn't think he wasn't. I just I mentioned in the in the interview that um, those medals are not in the book, which which he just said they're not in the book. I had to do some extra digging after I finished uh, reading Hitler's African Victims uh, by Raphael Schick. But he didn't want to share that. So I guess if you can read French or German and you find uh, the French or German edition of his book, uh, those those medals uh, will be depicted. Um, and again, <laughs> flexing his refinement, <laughs> I mean, uh, I don't bump into too many non-white people who can say that they have traveled to France uh, and Germany or, or for any other country just to study racism, white supremacy. I know Dr. Welsing, I think she, she tells the story of asking her parents uh, or telling her parents they asked her what she wanted for graduation, and she said she wanted to go to Germany to study white supremacy. Other than Dr. Welsing, I don't know non-white people uh, who take trips just to study racism, white supremacy. White people do this all the time. Um, I met a white person, a white woman, um, I guess few, uh, about a half a year before this program uh, started at Blog Talk Radio, uh, and she, she was German, coincidentally, German white woman. She came here to Seattle, Washington, a uh, student at the University of Washington. She said her purpose for coming here, study white supremacy. She sent me uh, some papers that she wrote about white supremacy and uh, just talked about her interest. But I mean, I meet white people like that all the time. 
they stay on their job. That's why I have white people here, and that's why uh, some of the programs, like today, I'm not really going at the white person that hard. I just want the information they have because I have concluded the system of white supremacy produces stupid black people. I'll say that again just so you can make sure I don't have any fear about that. If you're angry or what have you, uh, you know, just evaluate is what I said true. The system of white supremacy produces stupid black people. That's one of their objectives. That's why you had us out in the streets and, and going to the Supreme Court to go to school and all that stuff. What he just talked about, Reverend Kevin Annette, with the residential schools, the system of white supremacy is designed to diseducate non-white people. That's one of its core functions. So I bring white people here who travel the globe to study their system because they just have information that most non-white people do not have. That's one of the core functions of this program to get out constructive information. So Raphael Sheck, I hope people uh, go back and check out that program because I think it's, it's very uh, informative. Uh, last thing I wanted to share before open the phone lines up. Um, <laughs> Um, Charles Barkley, um, oh, oh, let me, let me, let me get on my job here. Um, okay. Uh, this guy, he's a victim, let me, <laughs> victim, 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 victim of white supremacy. Okay. Charles Barkley, and he's married to a white person. Charles Barkley, um, I stopped watching basketball. I used to be a basketball fanatic, okay? Um, I mean, I watched every game. I didn't care who was playing. It could be the team with the worst record in the world. Didn't care. NBA basketball, let me, let me be specific. I was a NBA basketball fanatic. That was my heroine. Um, I stopped watching because of racism, white supremacy. I think I've shared this before. Specifically, uh, there was a fight. Uh, between the Detroit Pistons and the Indiana Pacers. Uh, Ron, <laughs> Ron, Artest, Ron Artest was cast as the villain because uh, a suspected racist uh, threw a beer and hit him in the face. He went in the crowd to go uh, smack this white person uh, to respond, counter violence, and uh, he got suspended for the rest of the year. Huge story. You can, you can see it online. Anyway, the, the way it was covered, it was the total imagery of King Kong, savage brute. They showed so many pictures of him uh, towering over this white person about to pounce on him. It was just incredibly disrespectful and racist uh, the way it was covered, and uh, it, it severed my relationship with basketball. Uh, and, and all of this happened at the same time that they put the, uh, the dress code in effect and all this other stuff. All this happened at the same time, 2004. Uh, at the time, I was very confused about racism and white supremacy. I didn't know about Mr. Fuller's work. I hadn't read his book, hadn't heard his lectures or anything. Um, but I stopped watching basketball, and I started writing. I started writing a journal about racism. The only thing that I still enjoy, thoroughly enjoy, I like watching Inside the NBA. Uh, that comes on TNT. Uh, it's Charles Barkley, Kenny Smith, and Ernie Johnson. Ernie Johnson, white person, suspected racist. Um, and I, enjoy, I still enjoy it because it's racism, white supremacy on display. Uh, it's, it's total, it's like a minstrel show, basically. They, uh, they, they, they pick on and make fun of Charles Barkley, basically the whole show. Um, get, just, it's foolishness. Just watch one of the episodes. They're all online. Just watch one of the episodes. You'll see all kinds of foolishness. I just wanted to catalog some of the just extreme foolishness that is broadcast on this program. They have had Charles Barkley on this show uh, kissing a white man. They show, and they show this clip repeatedly of him kissing a white man. Uh, they had him kissing a donkey. And, and not just kissing the donkey. He kisses the donkey's rear end. This was in a, he made a bet about uh, Yao Ming, and he lost a bet, and he, he was supposed to uh, kiss uh, I'm not going to say it. He's supposed to kiss, uh, you know, someone's derriere, and they worked it out, so he ended up having to kiss an actual donkey. Uh, and so they show this clip repeatedly. Uh, and most recently, he was on TV saying that he wanted, Ernie Johnson, he wanted the white man 
to tase him. Kid you not, this is, this is recent. This is in the last couple of weeks. He was on TV, and he said, yeah, I want you to tase me. And they're just looking at him like, what are you talking about? And he's like, yeah, I keep seeing it on TV, and da 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 and, you know, I just want to see what it feels like. I want, Ernie, I want you to tase me. And uh, they, I'm, I'm waiting. I'm waiting for them to uh, have the program where he gets tased. But, I mean, they were joking about I mean, just a myriad of, of just foolishness. They even, they even had one. One of the staple things that they do on this program is they will, they will show um, – or they will use like Photoshop or whatever and have these goofy pictures and superimpose uh, like Charles Barkley's face or Kenny Smith's face on someone else's body and, and just show them doing stupid stuff. One of them, they showed a picture of Thomas Jefferson on the slave plantation. Ooh, ooh, ooh. <laughs> be on my job. Um, so they show a picture of Thomas Jefferson on the slave plantation and they superimpose Charles Barkley's face on one of the slaves in the background. And uh, this is supposed to be ha, 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 funny, funny. Everybody's laughing. And Kenny Smith, who's also a black person, for you, for you guys who don't know, Kenny Smith, he's also guys and gals listening. Um, he's a black person. And he was like, oh, wait a minute. You could see he was thinking this, this might not be acceptable. I don't know if I'm just going to laugh and go along with this. And he's like, that's not funny. And uh, they take it down, and they put it back up later. Ha, 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 big joke. Uh, total menstrual show total menstrual show. And I mean, Charles Barkley, um, he's written a book. He wrote a book called Who's Afraid of a Big Black Man, uh, where he's talking about racism. He interviews, uh, <laughs> man, he interviews Tiger Woods. Um, he interviews, um, it's real interesting. It's real interesting, the, the people that he chooses to interview for this book about who's afraid of a big black man. Um, he, he made a comment. I remember he was at the All-Star game uh, several, it was almost 20 years ago. He was at an All-Star game, and he said on the camera, uh, that's why I don't like white people. Keep in mind, he was married at the time and still is to a white person. And uh, it was a big to-do when he made this comment. You know, they were like, what? You racist? I can't believe you said that. Charles Barkley's a racist. And he, he came back and said he was joking and all this other stuff. But, yeah, Charles Barkley, I just wanted to point that out because the, the foolishness that they've been showing has just been, you know, unreal. The, the, the taser thing was kind of uh, <laughs> the straw that broke the camel's back, him asking a white man to tase him. Anyway, um, and I also wanted to, to point out the Friday broadcast with uh, Mr. Adam Potok. Excuse me. Is that – I think I uh, – it's Mark. Mark Potok. Sorry about that. Mark Potok. Um, someone said – I don't know if they verbally made this comment or if they wrote it, but they said that he sounds just like the racists that they – they being the Southern Poverty Law Center – alleged to be working against. And I thought about that, particularly at the end of the program – and uh, I was like, he, he did, in my view. He did sound like Bill O'Reilly. That's, that's what I hear these folks do, uh, get mad and yell and try to intimidate the people that they're talking to and call them names and stuff. He sounded like Bill O'Reilly right there at the end. Um, so that was my thought, whoever, whoever it was that, that left that comment after I thought about it. It, it made sense. I think, uh, I think they're correct. Um, but, yeah, we'll be back tomorrow. Um, I think that's everything I wanted to share. Yeah, I think that's everything I wanted to share. Um, and also calling out myself, I slipped and said fair twice uh, on the last two broadcasts, but I immediately caught it and corrected. Just wanted to point that out. I, like everyone else, am subjected to an incredible amount of brain trashing, brainwashing, whitewashing under the system of white supremacy. However, with terms, it's not that difficult. Um, in fact, I, I can tell you the first time that I was informed about why it's incorrect to use the term fair, uh, it was the first time I called Mr. Fuller. First time I called him, I think I asked him a question, and I said, is that fair? And he said, watch that word fair. <laughs> and uh, I was like, what's wrong with that? And, and he, you know, just uh, he, he was on his job. He did, gave the explanation of why you don't want to equate whiteness with correctness, justice, um, saying, you know, you, you're not treating me fairly. You're not treating me like a white person. It immediately made sense, and I became hyper uh, sensitive and just self conscious about making sure I wasn't using that term. So I just want to compare that to uh, Timothy, uh, who you know repeatedly uses the term on this program after I've prompted him 10, 20 times, uh, and 
Mark Potok, who was on the program uh, Friday, in addition to all of the other things he did that were suspicious, uh, the $30 million a year budget uh, that the Southern Poverty Law Center has, uh, no definitions for racism, white supremacy, justice, and white attorneys founded this organization, and they don't have definitions for any of those terms. Um, in addition to all the other things, he used the term fair 12 times on that broadcast, and he was only with us for an hour. 12 times in one hour. That's fair being said once every five minutes. Um, real telling, real telling. Um, yeah, everybody that called in, uh, your line is open. If you uh, have any comments, today's program or anything, racism, white supremacy, uh, you are with us. Was it actually uh, Charles Barkley or was it like an uh, animation of him kissing uh, the white man and uh, the donkey's ass? Oh no! This is live. This is live. You can you can watch this uh, online right now. He kissed the white man, uh, and he was an old white man too. Um, a white man that I would estimate is over fifty. Um, they were doing a relay race. <laughs> how how much minstrelsy this is? Uh, he challenged them to a relay race. They did the relay race. Charles Barkley outran this white guy. So you have, uh, and they pick on Charles Barkley for being overweight too. So they have tubby black man, black male, excuse me, tubby black male out running against this old white guy. Charles Barkley wins, and then they have a kiss at, after the, the race is over. Uh, and the, uh, when he kisses the donkey, that is also real. This is not animation. He kisses the donkey on television, and this is also a clip that they show, you know, pretty regularly. So, yeah, I can, I can send you links so you can see all of this stuff happening. And the taser thing is real, too. This wasn't a joke him requesting that the white guy tase him. Yeah, that's well. That's well. Um, I didn't catch most of the of, of today's program, but it did sound interesting. I'm going to be sure to go back and um, and make sure I hear it all. But um, I, I wanted to ask, did, um, well, a couple of things. It sounds like he, the uh, uh, Kevin Annette, he was saying that religion um, was playing a part in dividing uh, the non-white natives in his attempts to do the correct thing. Um, did you understand that being the case? Yes, I think he said that uh, explicitly, I think, um, where he said they had, uh, I guess, different denominations and, you know, would squabble and bicker about who had the correct religion or who's not, I guess, practicing it the, the correct way. Um, yeah, I think, he, I think he said that explicitly on the broadcast. Okay. It sounds like you were saying, too, this uh, was a pretty uh, uh, solid and informative uh, program. Uh, what what were some of the uh, constructive uh, tidbits or information that you uh, that, that stood out to you? Um, let's see. Wow. He, uh, he said, I think at the very beginning, he was talking about how he was hearing these stories from non-white people about, um, about how they had been mistreated in these residential schools and different people killed and uh, the pedophilia. And I asked him if he believed these folks, if he thought they could have been lying or exaggerating. And he said, you know, I, I, I'm a white person. I've been conditioned just like everybody else. So my racism was like, eh, they're probably making something up. I thought, you know, that was, I, I appreciated that honesty just him admitting I'm a white person, I've been conditioned just like every other white person to be racist, white supremacist. And so, yeah, some of that initially I was thinking, man, nah, they're, they're just, you know, talking nutty. Um, he broke down in vivid detail the pedophilia that happened in these residential schools where uh, white racist sexual predators um, just went rampant in terms of abusing these non-white kids. Uh, he even shared one story about uh, how a uh, white priest uh, fathered a child with one of these young non-white girls, and they murdered the offspring so that uh, this wouldn't come out. Uh, and he talked about how this is still ongoing, how it's easy to uh, just come in and, and snatch up uh, a non-white child off the reservation because these people have no rights uh, because of the continuance of racism, white supremacy. Uh, I think he called it, uh, or he didn't call it, it's the uh, the Indian Act. 
uh, where they all non-white people, the indigenous population, they are considered wards of the state. They're not citizens, so they don't have rights, and white people can come in and just take their children anytime they want to without, they don't even have to give a reason for why they're doing this and how it just becomes a haven for sexual predators uh, to just come in and snatch up kids and engage in pedophilia. Um, the Vancouver Club, he said that uh, you still hear prominent stories. The Vancouver Club, I guess this is uh, uh, an organization for prominent white people, suspected racist white supremacists, uh, how they, there's evidence that these people, people that are in this organization, uh, are possibly engaged in uh, pedophilia and uh, sexual abuse against uh, these non-white children. Uh, he talked about uh, germ warfare, and he gave very explicit information about how this was uh, an intentional and deliberate act uh, of germ warfare, smallpox, tuberculosis, uh, to depopulate the non-white individuals uh, in this area. Um, let's see. He talked about how religion, uh, I thought this program, the original sequence, this program was supposed to air the day after Anthony Pryor was on last week, and someone asked if religion uh, was the strongest weapon of racist white supremacists, and he was pretty much saying that uh, the Christian church has in many ways been the foundation uh, of racism, white supremacy, and that is an integral weapon of how they abused and obliterated the non-white population. It was, it was basically they had a mandate from God, and uh, he has... Uh, the, the Bible passage that's in the description of this program, that's, I think, the, the first title card in his documentary, and he just explained why that's there and uh, just how Christianity has been uh, an awesome weapon uh, for the maintenance and expansion uh, of racism, white supremacy. So those would be some of the, the main highlights. And he had other stuff, too. He just had a lot of, a lot of very detailed information uh, about the system. Yeah, I'm going to uh, definitely be sure to check that out. I mean, I, I know he is a, a white person, and so white people tend to have um, just a, in ordinary, a, a, a super uh, access to information. But I'm wondering, did the documentary or did him on the show today give any um, methods of how he went about gathering all this information? He listed sources. Uh, he dropped some books uh, along the way because I was asking him, you know, could you cite evidence of how you got this um, primary source where he talked to people, and, and some of these people are in the documentary film, uh, Unre Unrepentant, if you watch it, uh, where he got some of the information. Uh, he was saying that some of this stuff is in the newspaper if you just dig through the archives. Um, like I said, he dropped specific books as well. Uh, he listed uh, a litany of, of sources for where he got this information from in the program. Thanks. Yeah. Hello, Gus. Reading, I get. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Hey, how you doing? Um, did he say that something uh, that motivated him was the church broke up him and his wife? Uh, I don't know if he said that motivated him, but he did say that that happened, yes. Uh, and he talks about that in detail in the documentary, um, how they uh, encouraged his wife to divorce him and uh, aided her in the process and said that they would you know, get her documentation and information to help her um, get this divorce, and uh, he lost custody of his children. Um, he goes into a lot of detail about that, but I don't know if he said that that motivated him to do this work. I think he talks about it more as... as perhaps even an obstacle, something that, that made it difficult or was a consequence uh, of doing this work. Uh, but I don't know if he said it motivated him to do it. Okay. Yeah, I wasn't sure about that. So yeah, I thought I'd ask you. And unrepentant, that's like when uh, you were talking about Tim Wise, you know, using the word fear, and then the guy that um, hung up on a, on a, on a couple of shows, um, I mean, he wasn't even quoting you right, and he still was, you know, had an attitude. So that unrepentant, it seems, it seems to be an accurate term. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Was his wife a, uh, or do you know, was his wife white or non-white? Um, I'm, I feel, I want to feel like I say I saw her in the film. Um, I might not have though. I, I might be making that up. Um, I can't, yeah, I can't say for certain. I can't say for certain. I, I want to say from watching the film that I was pretty certain she was a white person, but uh, I'm not for sure. But I'm pretty certain she's a white person just from, from watching the film. But I could be incorrect on that one. Yeah, I want to make sure I get that out again as well. Um, the gentleman, Mark Potok, that was here on Friday, uh, in addition to getting angry and, and calling me a fool, which I might be, um, that not quoting correctly, that is huge because that guy, uh, in addition to being the director of their intelligence project uh, and the people who run that organization being attorneys, he is an experienced journalist. He worked for USA Today. He covered the Oklahoma City bombing for USA Today, major publication. To my knowledge, they don't just let anybody walk in and write stories for USA Today, much less to cover a major event of terrorism like what happened uh, in 1995 uh, with the bombing of that federal building in Oklahoma City. Uh, Mark Potok covered that. So uh, to have someone whose job has been words, writing, quoting people correctly and not being able to be careless with things that you say, the fact that he did not have definitions for racism, white supremacy, and justice, and didn't even think it was an issue or a problem, and then to incorrectly quote me and say that I said you're a racist white supremacist because I don't agree with your definition, no part of that was accurate. I didn't say he was a racist white supremacist. I didn't even say he was a suspected racist. I said, I suspect you are consciously practicing racism, white supremacy, and I would point to you not having definitions. So no part of his statement was even in the ballpark. It was practicing. I suspect you're practicing racism, white supremacy, and not that you don't agree with my definition. It's that you don't have one at all. So just to point that out, uh, this is a white person who's, whose job for at least the last 15 years has been about words and being extremely precise with words. I was just even on that episode alone, I mean, not even knowing any of his uh, background work or even heard him talk ever before, just on when he was on the cows. I think he demonstrated a mastery of using words. I mean, and he was quite witty, and he seemed very comfortable um, um, in the way he was talking. And so, I mean, I agree. To misquote, not have definitions, I just felt like he was in bully mode. And it's like, hey, well, I'm, you know, I'm white. I'm gonna do what I want to do anyway. And you, know, you know, very conscious. I was thinking about that coin with the uh, female tied to the um, penis or whatever. Um, yeah, in Russia, they got this uh, documentary out called From Russia with Hate. And they're, like, trying to pass, they might have already passed it, but they were trying to pass um, anti-miscegenation laws out there. That was one of their uh, big issues. Uh, I guess they they were galvanizing the people with with that anti miscegenation laws, where they was making it illegal uh, for women to um, marry a non white. You say this was recent. Uh, this... Yeah, it's called uh, it's a documentary called From Russia with Hate, and uh, it's a bunch of Russian. Uh, they're 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 all 
mad about um, immigration and they have these uh, videos where they go out and beat up non-white people, like beat them to death, like um, throw them off trains. I mean, it's very violent, but, you know, that's what's going on out there. You know, people go out there, a lot of the uh, people that they were um, assaulting were like students, you know. They were out there to study and, and whatnot, and uh, they would catch them, you know, coming from school or whatever, and videotape, um, videotape them, like beating them up and stuff like that. It's, it's, it's um, deep. And one of the officials, he's the one that's pushing for this anti, like he, you know, they went to him and asked him what he felt about all of this uh, crime. And, you know, he was basically giving excuses of why it was happening. And, yeah, he was trying to pass this uh, anti-message nation. And um, so they were saying it's very dangerous in Russia right now for non-white people. Is that documentary uh, available online, or is that when you got to go to the, the video store to pick up? Um, it's online. You can, I think it's on YouTube, and you, if not, you can go to uh, CurrentTV.com and watch it on there. They're the ones who broke it's, the story. It's Russia, uh, from Russia with Hate? Yeah. Russia with Hate, okay. Uh, I'm adding one person uh, called in, Vicus3. Uh, your line is open. Did, did you want to talk or are you just listening? guess they're just listening. No problem. Yeah. I, there have been a lot of press um, recently about those those racist white supremacist attacks in uh, Russia. Um, I, I started seeing that during uh, the election of President Obama. Um, yeah, that's that's one I haven't paid as much attention to uh, just because, you know, Russia is so far away. But, yeah, that that's uh, apparently been a big, big thing uh, in that part of the world uh, past couple of years or so. Yeah, it's like a source of revenue. I mean, they selling those DVDs like hotcakes. And, um, <laughs> yeah, you know, when the guy, he was saying that they're reaching the children through uh, the music. Yeah, they have that, 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 that rock music with all that hate. And and I guess the other media is these DVDs. And the, the guy that started um, this whole uh, movement or whatever, uh, he 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 sells the, the DVDs and the and the kids they watch the white the white racist white supremacist youngsters they watch these DVDs and they want to be like a reality star on them so they go out on their own with no affiliation with these other people and make their own DVDs so it just sparked all this violence. Did you say current TV uh, is the folks who are involved in filming it, or are they just rebroadcasting it? Yeah, they they filmed it. They they went out there and did the um, documentary. Uh, hello, can I be heard? Hello? Yes. Yes. Uh, Gus? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Oh, okay. Um, I'm sorry. I just I just wanted to. Uh, I had I I didn't hear the show, so I will be sure to download the archive. I listened to the archive of uh, Mark Podock. Is it Podock or Podock? I think it's Potock. I think that's what I was saying. He didn't correct me. Okay. Yeah, I listened to that archive uh, yesterday. And, uh, I mean, it, it really just seemed to me like, uh, I mean, I could almost hear him in his office saying, you know, how did I get the interview with the nigger? You know, how did this happen to me? Yep. yep. You know, what, you know what, what have I done to deserve this, you know? I mean, I could almost see him in the office complaining about it, you know what I mean? And, uh, I mean, it just seemed like his tone th throughout the entire interview. Was like you know you know how did I draw this shit you know oh I'm sorry I shouldn't have used profanity but that's what it seemed like to me and I just thought that was very interesting 
and you know, and you, and you, you were very cordial, you were very polite, and it didn't even matter, you know. Yeah, I think uh, Cree, when she uh, called the program, I uh, think her, her observation of when you challenge these white people or make it seem like you are not just in love with them and so appreciative for them, you know, being honest and, and talking about racism and white supremacy, that it, it is just uh, totally unacceptable and they become irate at that point. I think that is uh, correct. And I think, uh, I think his tone would have been completely different if I had just been nice and you all are doing such wonderful work and three cheers for SPLC. Yeah. Uh, I think it would have been totally different. Uh, I think him actually getting questioned uh, and scrutinizing some scrutiny about what they do. I think, uh, and particularly coming from a black person. Yeah. I, I think, uh, he was he I, like I said he I, whoever made that comment I don't remember who it was but I think they were totally correct he sounded just like Bill O'Reilly and all the other people that they call out as as being uh, racist white supremacists and had the unmitigated gall to say if you think a hundred and some odd million is enough to stop racism. Uh, what do you say? You're, you're kidding yourself or something like that. Uh, He's like, like wow. you live in another country than me. Yeah. <sighs> man. Like, he didn't want nobody messing with that money, man. He, we like, we need more money than that. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, and I agree with them. $170 million, no, that is not enough to stop racism. I totally agree. No disagreement there at all. Uh, it's, it's even non-white people who have way more money than that, and that has not done anything to stop racism and white supremacy. So no argument there with Mr. Potok. You think the... You know, he'd have the, a bunch of white people, uh, very educated, informed white people, dealing with uh, $150 million, $30, $30 million a year, could be uh, more constructive in their efforts to replace white supremacy with justice than um, uh, Southern Poverty Law Center, at least uh, from what Mark uh, described? <laughs> um, I mean, I don't have phone or computer, so I mean, my budget is like, you know, zero. Um, but I, I definitely think if uh, if you got thirty million dollars a year, they could be doing a ton more. Now I don't know everything that they do, but I mean I've been a subscriber uh, for I guess about a year, so I get regular email updates about what they're doing. If they have a court case, if they win a court case. Uh, they have investigations where they'll go around and do counts of groups that they label hate groups, quote, unquote, um, and all this stuff. I, I think they could be doing a ton more. Um, I mean, I, don't, I have no idea what they even do with $30 million. I mean, they just have, from what I've seen, the websites and court cases. I, I, I can't fathom how $30 million would go into all that. Like, it would have to be, where else is this money going? What else are you doing with $30 million a year? I mean, and he seemed like that was nothing. Like, $30 million a year, that's, that's, that's peanuts. I mean, I, that's a lunch for me. I mean, I, 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 I could be incorrect. That seems like a lot of money. If you got $30 million, you could be doing, they could do a Super Bowl commercial. They could get a Super Bowl commercial and just talk about white supremacy with $30 million. Yeah, I mean, I think he, I think he said they have less than 150 employees. I mean, where's all that money going? It's like it's big business, like racism, like it's big business for them. You know, it's uh, very lucrative with no definitions. That's why, I, that's why I said it, like, the way he said it was like, yeah, he was just doing the most, but 
and that air of um like, yeah, we need more money, we're trying to get some you know, like that ain't even <laughs> enough. Oh man. But like I said, unrepentant. Unrepentant. That's I think that's something that people might not really understand. It's like you can bring out all the facts just like you did and you know, definitions and, and things and they 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 don't they don't it's like they don't care. They don't want to change whatever they're doing. It's like I'm not about to listen to no black people tell me about racism. Are you kidding me? <laughs> I mean, according to uh, Kevin and Nett, even the white people don't want to listen to him. Uh, the white lady asked him, hey, "So you got any evidence about this?" He said, "Well, hey, here's an eyewitness right here." The lady walk away. <laughs> you know. So they, you know, they um. I don't think it's evidence that's going to have white people stop practicing racism. You know, it's not going to be evidence and facts. Yeah, I agree with that. I don't think. Uh, I don't think the. Pro- I mean, white people have the evidence. I mean, <laughs> white people they could probably go talk to their grandmother and, and go to their attic or, or just talk about things that they did yesterday. White people, they know. They they. I hope that's one thing this program has illustrated. White people know more about what white people have done to non-white people than non-white people do. They do not need a presentation of evidence to correct this. That's not the problem at all. Like, when you were saying that this the same thing that they were doing uh, to those uh, Native uh, people or it's the same thing that went down in, in other parts of the world. Um, it reminded me of uh, Australia and how they did, you know, the, the um, so-called aborigine, aboriginals. Like you said, it's the same, same story, same M.O. And the Australians... Australian. The Australians were uh, like rioting or something. I've seen on TV where they were all the white people were rioting and they were they were abusing some people. I don't know if they were abusing Aborigines, but some some non-white people out there they was abusing, talking about this is our land, get out of our land. They were attacking uh, news crews and everything. This is our land. We don't want them here. After all of the murder and, and, and genocide they inflicted on the people, they they were out there acting. They were out there acting crazy. Just reminded me of the. Um, just reminded me of Australia and, and like you said, uh, a lot of other places. Yeah, they out there acting racist. You know, it seems crazy and look crazy, and it might be, but it's. It's racist. It's uh, having an understanding that no matter what the evidence is, you got to do this to maintain white supremacy or we fall. You know, I think white people got a firm understanding of the rise and fall concept. I'm outside, so I'm trying to keep the noise down. Um, I just wanted to uh, touch on when you talked about uh, Charles Barkley, because I have been watching the uh, playoffs. I was never a, uh, you know, I never followed every game with with basketball. Um, seeing that I'm a Raider fan, I've always followed the Raiders, but, I, but I've always tuned in during the playoffs. And, man, I can't agree with you more in regards to the minstrel show. Um uh, um, or with uh, is it inside the NBA? It's on TNT, correct? 
Yes, sir. Yes, yes. I mean, they they do a man. They do a phenomenal job butchering Charles Barkley, and and he is just completely oblivious to all of the antics, as well as uh, is it Kenny Smith? Yes, sir. Yeah, he's the other uh, you know black male on the show, and uh, the constant bickering between Kenny Smith and uh, and Charles Barkley is. Uh, Man, I mean that's that that to me is just so revealing, um, and I mean it highlights, in my opinion, you know why so many of the uh, uh, disputes happen between black males. I mean, you just see it; it just doesn't take much at all for two black males to go at each other's throats. Is Kenny Merrick uh, a white person too? No, his wife is non-white. She's uh, he's had her on the show before. But yeah, it's it's pretty uh, it's pretty blatant. It's it's just buffoonery, um, racist buffoonery uh, every time out. Like I said, they just um, have them doing stupid things. Um, they uh, they had one show where uh, Charles, like I said, they they constantly pick on Charles Barkley about his weight. Uh, they had uh, they had one show where they just they show him eating donuts and they just think that's so funny to watch him eat donuts. And had another show where they uh, he talked about some treat and they they had a white woman uh, scantily clad come out and put a bib on him and and I think it was Twinkies and ice cream or something. But she came out and and get, got him a Twinkie and something else. I mean, it's just straight foolishness every time out. Um, yeah, that's all I can say. Just straight foolishness every time out. Uh, in addition to him kissing the white guy and kissing the the donkey and requesting that the white guy tase him, it's just uh, it's just a straight minstrel show. She put the bib on him first. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Did you see when they put him in the white face uh, when he was trying to mock uh, Sammy Sosa? Oh, yeah, that's right. Yep, 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 yep. I mean, when you were first initially uh, saying, uh, you know, uh, Charles Buckley uh, requested to be tased, I mean, I know it's not right, but I was like, <laughs> You know, tase him. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I mean, you know, <laughs> but uh, yeah, that's not right. But yeah, I, I I've noticed the same thing watching some of those uh, clips uh, uh, of of it. It seems like the white guy, he's the expert. He sits back and watch, you know, the, you know the black people uh, bicker or whatever, or if it's just two of them. It seems like the white, the white, um, the white guy always has to say something derogatory to the to the to the black guy, like he's like he doesn't know what he's talking about, or or just some offhand comment uh, that really didn't seem to, you know, fit. But just I guess just to make himself, uh, you know, be the bigger person or whatever. So like, yeah, that's a theme that I've I've noticed too. You know, just whenever I see it, um, just trying to see if whatever kind of commentary that they're going to give on the games and stuff. But, yeah, it's always, I've noticed that too. Yeah. I I tell folks, um, <clears throat> excuse me, I don't, I don't watch a whole lot of television, but um, I wouldn't tell anybody, you know, don't watch television, it's a drug. I would just say be mindful. I think Dr. Welsing has has even made a comment similar to that. Like, uh, I think she said to put a put a sign over the television and uh, that says uh, "white supremacist brainwashing" or something to that effect, so that you can be cognizant of what you are looking at, the programming, and what messages uh, it's sending to you. And I know for Neil Randall, I think she said the same thing. She said she would pester her son when she was on the program, you know, pay attention. What is it doing? What messages are they conveying? Because um, you can learn a lot if you, you know, you just watch TV. Just pay attention to what's happening. Because um, on that show, I think the way it runs, the white guy is clearly in charge, uh, both literally and figuratively 
he is the manager of the program. Like he, uh, I feel like uh, Kenny Smith and Charles Barkley, they clown and act silly and, uh, I mean, that's kind of what they're there for, to clown and act silly, and, you know, they actually play basketball so they can comment from that perspective, but it's basically them being silly and making their comments. And he, the white guy, Ernie Johnson, uh, manages things. Like, he stops the foolishness when they go too far off. He makes sure that the program runs on time and, and dictates what's going to be happening on the segment. Um, and and they consistently – if you watch this pro, and you don't have to watch a lot, you can watch one, and and you'll get an idea of how it runs. Um, but they consistently, um, in very overt, <laughs> very very overt terms, point out that Charles Barkley is dumb. Like they will, I think on one of the more recent broadcasts, they they asked. Uh, it was a yes no question. He said, "I just need a one word answer. Is such and such going to happen? Yes or no?" And Charles Barkley said. Um, a lot more than one word. He said something like, Charles Barkley thinks blah, blah, blah. And Ernie, the white guy was like, uh, one word response? And he did it again. He said like three or four words. And uh, he, he just left and he went to the other two people uh, and they gave a one word response. Thank you for following directions, one word. And Charles Barkley was like, what are you talking about? I answered the question. He was like, one word? And I mean, they'll, they'll do this. This is a theme. Uh, I think they'll, they'll have spelling contests uh, I think they asked Charles Barkley to spell your, um, like you're going to lose. And I think he spelled it Y-O-U-R, which is the incorrect your. Um, and they just cracked up laughing. Like, ah, ha, 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 ha. And they showed it, you know, three, four times, just showing it over and over and over again. Um, and I think he, they, they tried to get him to do it again, and he still spelled the, uh, it, it was the wrong your. Um, and they just, ha, 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 and they showed clips of that again. I know this new little stuff like this frequently. Um, just, you know, and, and Charles Barkley has even said on the show, I think you all are trying to imply that I'm stupid. And they just laugh and laugh and keep, I mean, racism, white supremacy, uh, ugly display, ugly display. And he's married to a white, uh, white woman. Keep that in mind as well. So do you get the impression that Charles Barkley is, um, I guess, not in the know? As far as uh, this, you know, making him out to be the clown. Um, I think, <clears throat> I think to some degree he is aware. Like I said, he has said more than once, "You all are trying to make it seem like I'm stupid." Um, I think it's kind of like uh, he's participating in the act, but I don't think he really understands. Like that, I think he he. I think he knows to some degree, yes, they're making fun of me and, and some of this silliness that uh, happens here on the program. Like they, they brought him out one time and he was just wearing, I think, boxer shorts or a pair of shorts and nothing else. So they have no shirt on, no pants on, and they put him on a scale to see how much weight he's. Like I said, it's a lot of fat jokes, too. You know, he's a fat black guy. Um, so I think he's in to some degree. But I don't really think he understands how this plays out in the system of white supremacy, like them, him as the black buffoon. Like, I don't, I don't really think he grasps it. Like, they, they call him uh, the black rhino um, frequently. I mean, it's, uh, I don't really think he has an understanding of the implications of this in a system of white supremacy at all, at all. Yeah, but he digested a lot better on check day. <laughs> I mean, but he's not broke. I don't think he has to do inside the NBA, you know, to make ends meet. I mean, Charles Barkley, uh, one of the 50 greatest players of all time. I'm sure, he made a lot of. And I mean, I know a lot of players lose their money, but I don't. I don't get the impression that Charles Barkley uh, is is doing this to to make a few nickels. I don't think I could well, be wrong. Though. Well, he does have a gambling habit. That's true. That's true. Good point. Good point. Excellent point. And they joke him about that, too. They joke him about that, too, because he was uh, in greater confinement for uh, drunk driving sometime last year, and they make jokes about that, too, him being in jail. I think they had a joke of him making license plates in Arizona or something like that, but they, they frequently make jokes about that, too. I've seen the clip of Charles Barkley. Um it's supposed to be impossible for you to eat like two pieces of bread at some uh, time limit, like a, like under thirty seconds or something. And so 
they gave him Kenny. Uh, he brought out the two pieces of bread. Did you see that? <laughs> I, can't, I mean, that's what I'm saying. I mean, it's so much of this that happens. You can't even you can't even remember. Like I've been watching him on Inside the NBA for years, and I mean, I can't even recall all of the goofy things that they have done to him uh, on this program. It's just. It's, it's ongoing. Go go ahead. Yeah. So he choking. He's choking on the on the. He's trying to eat his bread, and he's choking. <laughs> Man. Mm-hmm. And they are, you know, the, you know, Kenny and the white dude. I guess they already knew it was impossible, but you know, they go here. You know, try this. You know what I'm saying? And he choking, and they bust out laughing and whatnot. But what I was gonna say is, as far as his uh, awareness. Um, you know, they just had this major fight between Quentin Rampage Jackson and Rashad Evans. And Rashad Evans called uh, Quentin an Uncle Tom, and that got him, you know, Quentin was, was was upset about that. He was like, yeah, I'm just, you know, this is what I do. You know, I'm just trying to be funny and stuff like that. I think it's easy to get, uh, if that's the expectation, it can be easy for you to just play your role. You know, you you just, you know, that's what he was doing. He he would just play stupid. He would play dumb, and you know, dumber than he is. You know, and then he, it's like, you know, uh, uh, Rashad was like, "Why do you do that? You know, what I'm saying, why do you act dumb? Why do you act like you can't count? Why do you act like you can't read?" And Quentin really didn't understand. He just was mad about the comments, but he didn't understand why he was doing it. He felt like he was just doing it. You know, he didn't really know why. He thought it was funny and stuff. But I noticed that people just, I've seen what I've seen uh, as far as uh, celebrity and stuff like that. They just they just ease on into that role. And before they know it, it's like, wow, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm being a buffoon now. You know what I'm saying? And I can't just stop and be like, you know, I don't want to do this no more because then, then, you have to explain. Well, wh- wh- why'd you do it in the first place? In fact, that reminds me. Didn't Joaquin Noah from Chicago? Didn't he get upset with LeBron James uh, over some 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 antics that LeBron James was doing on the court? Hmm. I know who that because, is. <laughs> Because, you know, he has that ritual with the chalk now, you know, or whatever that stuff is he puts on his hands. And uh, he's very animated after certain plays at, at times. But I've seen him remember Jaquim Noah saying, you know, getting upset and saying, you know, hey, man, why don't you just play? You know, we don't need all of that, you know. Mm-hmm. I was going to say, I, I was just remembering when Anthony Pryor was on the program, and when he comes back, I'll make sure to bring up Charles Barkley. But I know he said in the book that he thinks a lot of black males, they behave in a similar manner uh, as Charles Barkley because they don't know how to respond when white people are making these comments uh, or mistreating them, practicing racism, white supremacy. They don't know how to respond. They don't uh, know what to say to correct the situation. And I definitely they just just the fact that they make fun of Charles Barkley repeatedly and his inability to speak. Like they, um, one of their running jokes, Charles Barkley will say athleticism, and he will not pronounce it correctly. And so they will just ha ha ha, and they'll replay it, and and they'll even ask him to say it. Now they'll be like, "What is that? They have more. At, what is it, Chuck? At, at, what say it, Chuck?" And and he won't say it or whatever. And I mean, it's a lot of that sort of thing, make ridiculing the fact that he is not as skilled with words as most white people are. And I think that might play into it. I think if he was more skilled with the use of words, I think he might be able to respond differently to some of the things that they do and say to him on the program. And I think that's true for non-white people in general. Now, now, do you pick up also on the fact that uh, on the show, Kenny Smith, I'm not sure if he's really aware of his role in it or if he just thinks the joke's just on Charles. 
Uh, I sus- <laughs> I unfortunately I, I suspect that he's not not informed either. Um, just just from what I've seen, I don't think he's informed either. I think uh, I think it's probably the same for both of them. I suspect it's worse for Charles Barkley because he's married to a white person. So I suspect it's a lot worse for him, and he he has a lot more money. So. Uh, I, I suspect that that means he, he most likely has more contact with white people. Um, but yeah, I, I don't think I don't think either of them are informed. I think they're both kind of missing out on the joke. And even how Kenny Smith uh, making fun of Charles Barkley when he you know doesn't spell your correctly and and the other things where they where they joke on him. I don't think he's aware of how he's playing into all of this. Uh, I don't think. Yeah, I, I would agree. It doesn't seem like he is at all. And I noticed uh, lately that they stopped using the board uh, that I've seen them use on CNN where they can, like, drag and drop images on a big screen. Mm-hmm. And I noticed this year I didn't see uh, so far in the play. Well, no, I think that was the last show yesterday. I didn't see him use that board. And, uh, and I wondered why they got rid of the board because it's a great tool, but at the same time, it highlights uh, Kenny Smith's intelligence of the game because he's able to manipulate all the players on the screen, you know what I mean, move them around, show how the plays are done, and it really makes it seem like basketball is a much more intricate game as opposed to just throwing a ball, you know what I mean, in a a hoop. But I noticed this season I didn't see that board at all. Hmm. I don't think I've seen it in the playoffs. I, re- I remember it. I think it was there this season, but you are correct. I haven't seen it. It's been a while since I have seen it, and I definitely think uh, – I don't think they give, like, Kenny Smith or Charles Bar- – well, I would probably say any of the non-white people, black – I mean, we're talking about black males. I don't think any of the black males that they have on, I don't think they give them the same respect that they do – a white coach, or even the white players that come on to talk or whatever. The white people in general, it seems that they are they are talked to as though they are much more cerebral in their understanding of what's happening. They are scholars of basketball, whereas these guys are just idiots and clowns who were born tall or athletic, uh, and they don't really understand what's happening. That's that's kind of the impression that I get. But yeah, I think that's a very keen observation about that board because I haven't. It's been months, I think, since uh, since since they've had the board up. Exactly, and it's like I say, it's a phenomenal tool to you know to really demonstrate you know just how intricate uh, uh, you know the plays are run and, and and that you know there is a level of intelligence one needs to have in order to be an NBA basketball player, that it's not just about athleticism. At least that's what the board demonstrated to me, so. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> sports. Sports, excellent, excellent tool for uh, breaking down racism and white supremacy, and particularly this show, like I said, because you got, you know, Charles Barkley there, Kimmy Smith, and this white, this white guy of no fame at all. To my knowledge, he's not a former player. Uh, I don't know what his connection is to basketball at all, but he is clearly – in charge of this show. Uh, in fact, I can remember it used to just be the white guy. Um, I don't remember when they added Kenny Smith, but I think he's been there at least 10 years, and the three of them have been together for 10 years. This was their 10-year anniversary. But, uh, yeah, the white guy, <clears throat> no basketball experience at all, to my knowledge. Coach, player, nothing. He is in charge of this program. The other two, they're just, you know, buffoons, comic relief, whatever. Um, Now, that reminds me, uh, because it's probably been about 10 years since it happened, uh, but he also used to do the football games on TNT. Remember when when TNT would host, I think, either Thursday night football? Mm -hmm. And uh, in one of the segments, he interviewed uh, an an ex-coach by the name of, uh, I think his name is Buddy Ryan, who was famous Mm -hmm. for the Philadelphia defense. And uh, there was I can't remember the black male that was on the uh, that was on the show with him at the time uh, co-hosting, but when Buddy Ryan came on the show, he refused to shake uh, what is it Ernie Ernie uh, the white guy's name Ernie something 
Ernie Johnson. Uh, Johnson. Ernie Johnson. He refused to shake his hand, you know, on national television. He, but he shook the black guy's hand because the black guy was an ex-player. And the implication was that you don't even know, he don't even know what you're covering, you know. You never played the game. You've never studied the game. Probably most of the stuff you're talking about doesn't make sense to, to anybody who's a, you know, who's a student of the game. But refused to shake the man's hand. I haven't seen uh, Buddy Ryan since. He hasn't coached since. <laughs> I mean, his sons are in coaching, but he hasn't coached ever since. I mean, just, I mean, uh, I mean, huge embarrassment. You know what I mean? I mean, the guy didn't know really how to handle the fact that he didn't want to shake his hand. But, uh, man, I wish somebody could dig up that footage. Because I can't remember the name of what they called it back then when they were doing the Thursday night football. But, uh. Yeah, yeah. Er- Ernie was, uh, you know, I'm sure, extremely, you know, he was humiliated, basically, on national television. And it never comes up again. Hmm. I remember Ali used to say that about Howard Cosell. He used to say, you, ain't never, you don't have an athletic bone in your body, but, you know, you know everything, you're an expert of, uh, in boxing. <laughs> <laughs> Howard Cosell. Yeah, I, I remember his infamous statement. You guys remember his statement? I got him kicked off the uh, Monday Night Football. Look yeah. at look, look at the little monkey run. Mm-hmm. Something to that effect. After someone had made a touchdown, you know, look at the little monkey go. Something like that. When Cosell was done. Yeah, I saw a special uh, on him where his, I believe it was his grandson was talking and he was defending Howard Cosell, his grandfather, and he was saying that, uh, you know, he did call this black guy a little monkey, but, you know, he called me a little monkey too. So, you know, he wasn't being racist. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> are, are there any sports shows that have it... Um I guess where the where the dynamic appears to be re, uh, reversed, where there's a non-white person that's given the appearance of being in charge, and you got a white person, I guess co, you know, co-showing. Mm, none that I can think of. Um, I know ESPN; they do have a lot of non-white. Well, let me take that back. They have non-white anchors. I'm not going to say they have a lot, but they do have non-white anchors. Um, but it's if you see a non-white anchor, you I don't get the impression that the non-white person is running the show and that the white person is just there uh, as an assistant. It's, you know, that they are co-hosting uh, the show. But most of the time, I think it's two white people uh, on ESPN. I know Stuart Scott is there. He's one of their bigger personalities, and they have a couple other uh, non-white people who uh, are big anchors there. But um, I, I can't think of any dynamic where it's reversed uh, in that manner, where the non-white person is the one that looks like he's in charge, and the white person looks like he's just there to be stupid and be the butt of jokes. Gus, I don't know if you. I think one of the something that I'm thinking about is I've I've been noticing that like uh, non-white people, black people in particular, they're very uncomfortable around white people. I mean, I know some black males and that are like you know stone faced most of the time, and soon as some white person comes around, they they show all their teeth. I mean, they go into this behavior that I. I've never even seen before, and uh, sometimes I just wonder, like, where is that coming from? I mean, they go right into that, that smiling, like, you know, the one of those smiles, uh, all your teeth showing, and it's like laughing. Nobody said nothing funny, nothing. It's just, like, it, 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 to me, it just seems like a very uncomfortable uh like you could tell, like it's just like wow, you you must be uncomfortable because you're doing stuff that's just totally um, nonsensical. Like 
there's nothing to smile. There's nothing to be laugh. You just start laughing. Like, <laughs> what, what, what? And um, I've seen that on some of the, the you know, like like it was, we were talking about the sports show. They always smiling and, and laughing. And I noticed, like, the white dude, he, he ain't smiling. He just looking like, and then he, he just showing all his teeth. Like in a in a frozen position, like in a frozen, like frozen with a smile on his face. Like mm-hmm. every talk, you ever notice that? Like, and I've noticed that just in general with uh, with not with, with black people too. They get into this uh, almost like some like ghost of uh, ghost of uh, Jim Crow past just uh, possess their body. <laughs> <laughs> like wow <Man. clears throat> I mean I can I can just tell you from personal experience when I was more confused about uh, racism and white supremacy I probably did a lot of the same things um, because I mean when you don't have words down when you really are not uh, accustomed to speaking correctly and being precise with what you say, and particularly when you don't have your words together and you're confused about racism, white supremacy, what that is, how that works, and what it means to be a white person, uh, it's kind of like being a deer in the headlights when a white person comes and they you know, are mistreating you and using their words skillfully and they got support of other white people. Uh, it can be real intimidating. Um, I know even now, you know, doing these programs and, and being live, uh, I still get nervous, like you know, uh, you know, it's it's uh, it can be an intimidating thing to be a double whammy black person in a system of white supremacy, and you're talking to Tim Wise, or you're talking to you know any of these other white people, Noel Ignatiev, you're talking to them and questioning them with suspicion. It it can be a frightening thing. These white people have a lot of power, and they can get at you, and just you don't want to be embarrassed publicly. You don't want to be made you know to look stupid or to be humiliated. So. Uh, and I mean, that's been us. That's been our history for I don't even know how long, hundreds of years of just being publicly humili- humiliated and ridiculed by white people uh, and laughing about it or getting paid to do it. Uh, that's a lot of our comedy. It's just coming up and, and making fun of each other. I mean, <laughs> that's a lot of our comedy. If you look at uh, our stand-up comedians ridiculing each other. So I think that's just one another symptom of and product of racism white supremacy and i think the way you combat that is to uh refine your ability to use words and to become more informed about racism white supremacy because i think it it happens to most black people i don't even know if i could pick out too many black people non-white people that it doesn't happen to even even at the the so-called educate like i said that skit on the boondocks where Thugnificent goes on the Bill Mayer show. I have seen that happen in real life with black people who are supposed to have mountains of education and degrees. I have seen that happen where, you know, a very so-called, quote, unquote, informed black person ended up looking like Thugnificent. So, you know, that's uh, when you start to see less of that happening, I think you'll know that we're making some progress in replacing white supremacy with justice. And white people do regular maintenance on that. I mean, they um, they are very aware of when they are around non-white people and the non-white people are not laughing or smiling or appearing like they enjoy this. So white people are very, you know, they're very conscious of that. So much so, like I had a white person one time. We were sitting there. I mean, this was, um, I was, just, I say, trying to get a little more informed about what's going on in the world with racism and white supremacy. And she came up and was like, uh, you know, you all looking so serious over here. What's what's the matter? What's what's going on? you all looking so serious. And it was her attempt to be like, well, hey, you know, I'll be way more comfortable if you all get to show them some teeth and smiling and grinning or something. You know, it puts them on edge like, hey, this this guy might be the one to, uh, to snap on us, <laughs> you know, and, and so you know it, it puts them at ease when you when you when you when you're grinning and giggling with them. Mm. Yeah, I would just add that it, it for me it takes a conscious effort not to grin and smile around right around uh, white people. I mean, you got to be mindful of it because that's the default response: smile, grin, show some teeth. 
I mean, just try, just just say to yourself, you know, today I'm not smiling at no white folks at all. And you're right. You're going to get a question or two. Somebody's going to say something. Because they are not conditioned to seeing that. They're conditioned to seeing that function like the entertainment community. That is correct. And I mean, when when and I live around a lot of white people myself, and when, when they get upset at each other, oof, man, stand back, go run for cover, because it can get it can get violent with them even real quick. Mm. You know, once they do get upset. And I, I never met a white person that wasn't an expert. I mean, like that guy uh, that misquoted Gus. He, he, he just knew he was right. Right. So that could be intimidating, too. To use that, you know, that's part of that's part of uh, that's in a in a toolbox. Uh, and the truth I come across is being most correct, no matter if dead wrong, you know. But give the appearance as if what they saying and doing is 100 percent on the money. It's accurate. No need to question it, you know. I think that's exactly what uh, Dana Carney, when she was on the program, uh, I think that's pretty much what a lot of her work centers around, how it's easy for uh, white people. She says people are in power, but on the program, white people, that's what we said. Uh, it's easier for them to lie, to, uh, to harm individuals because you're in that position of power and you're just a lot more confident, you got support, and conversely, for non-white people, it's a lot more stressful. Uh, to lie, to challenge that person, because you know you're in a position of weakness. A lot of her work, that's exactly what it centers around. And I'm, I think that dynamic plays out for everybody. I think you have to do a lot of conditioning, studying, deprogramming to reverse that, and it's something that you have to practice. You really have to get in the habit of going out and talking to white people and working and just being self-aware. You know, is my heart rate increased? Am I nervous? Um, you know, that's, that's stuff that I pay attention to. Uh, am I talking faster than I normally would? Just little things that I try and pay attention to to make sure that I'm being calm and, uh, and being confident. You know, that's one of the big things I would say. Just become informed so that you can feel comfortable and confident talking to white people when they start acting rowdy and calling you names. You know, no big deal. Just stay calm. <laughs> um, that's, that's one of the big things that you can do um, to work against racism, white supremacy. And, and, we, need, and we need more examples of that because I don't think you, you get to see that very often uh, in terms of a non-white person who is not going into the smile and tap dance mode when they talk to a white person and can just stay calm and, you know, say what they're going to say and, and participate in the discussion. Um, we need that. We need more people to model that. I would totally agree. It, it needs to be modeled more, demonstrated more. Yeah. I had to stop going to restaurants, man, because uh, you know I didn't, I didn't, I didn't. You know how waiters, waitresses, or whatever they come and they are all smiling and chipper and cheery and stuff, and you know I I tried to maintain and you know if it wasn't nothing you know i'm not the smile chipper type person especially you know with, with around white people but i noticed that my you know my service uh just wasn't coming like no service and it just happened enough times where i just had to, i just said forget it man i don't like going to no more restaurants but because uh you know they want you to be a certain way and if you're not that way, then you end up, they're going to get you one way or another. So if you don't act the way they want you to act, then you're just going to look stupid there trying to wait on some 
water or wait on your check or your food or whatever. It's like you have to ask for the dang waiter, and that makes you look that that's just it makes you feel uncomfortable, especially if you're with, um, you know, you with youngsters and and and, and whatever. It's like, man, I had to go chase down my waiter because I wasn't smiling and stuff. So I was like, nah, man, you know, I don't want to go through that no more. <clears throat> yeah, I, I think I understand what you're saying. It, it definitely can be real uncomfortable. One thing I've, I've tried to do in situations like that is because I, I've noticed that white people, when they don't get correct service at a restaurant, they make a big deal. I mean, it's a it's an issue. It's not something they're going to just uh, take lightly. And so I try to be white in those situations and be like, you know, well, you know, if the waiter or server is not doing the correct thing, then the manager is going to have to come through. And, um, you know, but it's, it's really feeling confident enough to have your words together to know at least what to say uh, as in, you know, what should be happening in that situation, even if it was whoever sitting there in your seat. What is the correct thing that should be happening? And the manager's duty is supposed to make sure the correct thing is happening. I know one thing, one, one very powerful statement when you are dealing with white people is to, is to hit them with, I suspect you may be practicing racism and white supremacy. I mean, things come to a screeching halt. Yeah, what do you mean? What, you know, what do I do? What do I, I mean, I mean, it comes to a screeching halt if you hit them with that one, which I have had to do, you know, on the job. You know, someone makes a comment. And typically they've been drinking. Yeah, black people have to be aware more than they are. And, um, you know, not not reading, not, not studying, um, <clears throat> It's just not. It's just not in in this society, in this racist, white supremacist uh, system. System. You can't be. You can't relax. You have to be aware, or you know, you just have to be aware. So, yeah, people say that they get bored and stuff. They don't like to read and. Um, Watch video, you know, play video games and stuff, and grown, you know, that's just something that you can't do, you know. And uh, I try to, uh, yeah, I try to be an, ex- I try to be an example of that. Like, I used to play video games, but I, I just stopped. Like, nah, this is a waste of time. And then, oh, you don't play video games, man? I was like, nah, man, this is, so- you don't want to play? I'm like, nah, man, this is a waste of time, man. It's like. I don't want to do it. So, yeah, you got to be an example. I think that's that's mm-hmm. important because black people are very, man, they're, they're just, it's incredible, man. And I'm just saying, so I get that way sometimes. I mean, I, can, I understand it, but um, I try to, try to stay aware of, of the system. This is a deadly system, man. This is a this is a serious this is war right here. So you can't be all inebriated, high, drunk, un un uneducated or whatever, not you know, illiterate or, or however about the system and expect to uh not get caught in one of their traps. Uh, speaking of war, again, uh, Irritated Genie, author of War on the Horizon, the website, waronthehorizon.com. Uh, he'll be our guest tomorrow, his second trip uh, to the program. Uh, I think he'll he'll probably have a word or two about uh, the importance of being serious and uh, 
this is really not anything we want to play with. We want to be very serious because white people are very serious about the maintenance of racism, white supremacy uh, forever. Uh, so we need to be equally serious, if not more serious, about replacing that system as soon as possible. Um, and the video games, like I said, watching um, that flick with Don Cheeto and Wesley Snipes, um, Brooklyn's Finest, cured me. I'm done with video games. Just watching that flick right there and the gruesome depiction of racism, white supremacy, and the just flagrant contempt for black people in that film, uh, coupled with the fact that they showed black males playing video games all throughout the film, and frequently, just before a black person was killed, they showed a group of black males playing video games. Uh, I'm good on the video game front. Um, yeah, anybody, if you're trying to get rid of video games and having a tough time, watch Brooklyn's Finest, Don Cheeto, Wesley Snipes, uh, and, and catch that line, best line in the film, uh, white woman in all black, too, black, um, white woman dressed in all black, blonde. She says, uh, I'm not going out there. She's talking about one of the, the black areas. I'm not going uh, out to Harlem to clean up monkey, S-H-I-T, best line in the film. Best line, and she says it with conviction. Ugh, black male has just been gunned down in cold blood. Is that my job, to go out and clean up monkey? Brooklyn's finest. Brooklyn's finest. Uh, probably we have like five minutes left, so whatever you all want to say, you got like five minutes. I think um, kind of what Kevin Nett was talking about, that conditioned obedience, um, is a lot of what kind of we've been talking about after the show. It's just uh, how to behave in a manner that is against how you've been conditioned, um, you know, with the result being, well, with the conditioning being for you to be obedient, you know, pretty much not do much to disrupt white people's system of white supremacy. And so modified behavior is a great way to fight against being the conditioned obedience. Uh -oh. That a lot of black people and all non-white people, we all get uh, subjected to that. Behavior modification, very important, very important, um, especially for the non-white team because our conduct has uh, has not been up to par to uh, getting rid of racism thus far. So we definitely need a lot of uh, behavior modification. Um, white people say I have like three minutes left. Uh, anything else? Anyone else? Yeah, thought, speech, and actions. That's what I was thinking about today. Thoughts, speech, and actions. I think they should be on par. If you're saying something and you're thinking something else and you're doing something totally different, um, that's that's not what you want to be. You want to have them thoughts, speech, and actions in line with each other. I think that's the definition of sanity. <laughs> and an understanding of this system. It does uh, raise your IQ, like Dr. Wilson says. You understand a lot more just understanding this system. You see a lot more. So don't sleep on the archives. Well, uh, 
second that for sure. The uh, Everything becomes a lot more interesting when you uh, become informed about racism and white supremacy because it's everywhere. Um, I suspect I would not be as attentive in watching inside the NBA if I was not informed about racism and white supremacy. So now when I'm watching and I see a black male uh, gorging himself on slices of bread, very different response than some years ago. Uh, I might have just laughed. Hey, I might have laughed along with it. I'd have been, you know, snickering right along with everybody else. Look at Charles wolf that bread down. Um, yeah, <laughs> get in book because I'm, I'm telling you, if you're not informed about racism and white supremacy, it's going to come back to haunt you, probably uh, more so than you think. The less informed you are about racism and white supremacy, you're leaving yourself open to be uh, <clears throat> just severely mistreated, severely mistreated. Groovy, I'm going to prep for uh, Irritated Genie. Very much looking forward to the program. That should be great uh, tomorrow. I hope so, anyway. Um, yeah, thank you guys for tuning in. Um, favorite the program, support Cree's blog, Cree7.wordpress.com. Again, Cree7.wordpress.com. Uh, back of the bus, uh, his blog, nonwhitealliance.wordpress.com nonwhitealliance.wordpress.com and we have uh, another full week of shows. I think we have shows every day this week so far except for Wednesday and Saturday. And that might change uh, as, as things move along, but I think every day is filled except for Wednesday and Saturday this week. So very active spring continues. Uh, replace white supremacy with justice as soon as possible and uh, yeah, we'll be back tomorrow, 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific. The Irritated Genie should be a great broadcast. Uh, we'll be back soon. Thank you all for tuning in. The Cows signing out.